When the credits start rolling, but the movie keeps haunting you. Before, after. Then it's time to tune in to Dismembering Horror. We'll talk about what worked and also what didn't. We'll dissect every aspect. Maybe some of you shouldn't. He turned out to be a completely unreliable asshole. Take it away, boys. Hello, Tim. Hello, Ryan. <laughs> and hey, Peter. Hello, Ryan. <laughs> hey, guys. And hello, everyone listening. Welcome to Dismembering Horror. We're back. That's right. Episode 172 of Dismembering Horror. The podcast show where myself, Ryan McDuffie, and <laughs> <laughs> myself, Tim Aslan, <laughs> and sometimes a special guest, we dismember a horror film. We talk about what worked, what did not work for us, and anything else we found interesting or noteworthy about a, as I just said, a horror film. And today, as you may have just heard, we do indeed have a very special guest. In the house, in the dismembering horror house, none other than our first recurring guest, Peter Warden. Hello, Peter. Hello, Ryan, and hello, Tim. I didn't realize I was the first recurring guest. That's an honor. Yes, happy to be here. I thought it'd be fun to uh, to have a familiar face on mm. uh, to start us off right for our sort of uh, re re premiere here, our, our re debut, the requel, if you will. Oh my goodness, <laughs> we're starting already. <laughs> So, so Peter, so, uh, so just so we have a little more context for our listeners than you just being a guy named Peter here, who's a friend of ours, I want to ask you some get to know you questions. Shoot. So, t- Peter is a very talented actor. So, Peter, I'd like to hear your three favorite roles you've acted in in theater. Peter does theater. Oh, my goodness. Okay. Three favorite. No, I can do this. All right. Um, Yes, thank you for that question. I appreciate it. All right, my three favorite roles, I will say one would definitely be Felix Unger in The Odd Couple. Uh, Number two was a character named Peter in a show called Silent Sky by Lauren Gunderson, uh, where I played a foreman at a... Yeah, never mind. Yeah, it it was a really great role. It was like a romantic role and also kind of like I wasn't really a great guy as well. It was uh, all different facets of what I could do. And I think number three, going way back to college years, a flea in her ear. I was, um, yeah, it was a big, fun, farcical comedy that I got to just be as wacky and crazy as I wanted to be. All right. <laughs> Some for the the theater fans, and then we got the odd couple there. I recognize that one. Oh, good. I'm glad. <laughs> so uh, then for context here, for we're talking about movies today, I wanted to know not necessarily what your favorite films were, but if there is a linking trait to films that generally are your favorite films, what would those be? Okay, that's interesting. I my favorite kinds of films, I will I will say right up top, um horror isn't necessarily my top favorite uh genre of film. I'm more of a comedy guy, I'm more of a drama guy, I'm more of a dramedy sort of guy. I'm the, someone who will like movies that just tug at the heartstrings and make you laugh as well, whether that is something that can be really cheesy or something that can be really like emotionally dramatically intense. That's that is my game, but uh, what I mostly gravitate towards. Great. And uh, tell us a bit about your podcast. Oh, my podcast. Yeah, I guess it still exists. It didn't. <laughs> it's been a few months, a few months. God, it's been a few. No, a few months. It's been like seven months since my last uh, show. Uh, it was a show called Retro Reviews where I did with my friend Ray. Uh, we basically would go to to 10 years ago or older but no farther back than the year 1980 so by today it would be anywhere from 1980 to the beginning of 2012 and just whatever movie we feel like talking about uh whatever strikes our fancy we just spend an hour or so talking about it and um whether uh sometimes it's it can be contentious but a lot of times we really agree we seem to be mostly on the same wavelength as far as films go and we tend to we don't do this intentionally but we tend to do movies that we really really like we don't do a lot of like uh movies where we just 
slam or try to be like angry or upset about these movies. It does happen, but for the most part, it's like, okay, what's another favorite movie of mine? Oh, cool. Okay, cool. Yeah, Ray, let's do this. And that's how it goes. But hopefully it'll pick back up again soon because I, I do miss doing it. Um, Great. Yeah. Then it will. Cool. All right. Thank you, Peter. So we got a lot to talk about today. This was about uh, over a year ago, Tim and I released our four episodes for our October special talking about the four Scream films that previ- that, that still exist. Priya's going to say previously existed. <laughs> that uh, we wanted to do, a, uh, but we, we wanted to preserve what our thoughts were in a pre-Scream 2022 world. And now, Tim, we have entered that new reality <laughs> with a fifth Scream film. So we are here today to follow up and discuss and dismember as we do and to get right into it i think we should just get in with the trailer are you ready tim yeah peter oh, i can't wait all right here we go trailer for from 2022 scream hello it's happening three attacks so far do you have a gun i'm sydney prescott of course i have a gun Something about this one just feels different. Samantha? I'm... I know who you are. I've been through this. A lot. This is your life now, which means that whoever this is is gonna keep coming for you. You ready? For this? Never. No, stop! Wait, wait, wait! certain rules to surviving. The attacks were all on people related to the original killers. Whatever his link is to our past. It's cool. Here we go. Scream. Had you seen the trailer? No, I did not yeah. watch that leading up to it. Yeah, I avoided it pretty hard too. I know I watched a trailer, but I don't think it was that one. I don't, That gave away way more than I... I feel like i would have known so yeah. yeah all right well after the trailer we like to jump into our rating per our rating system would we tell ourselves to avoid stream rent or buy this film so peter being our guest and i'm gonna ask for uh, a long lead up here peter because you know as you said earlier you are not a horror guy mm. So now for your Scream context, why I really wanted to have you on the show, it's even though you don't identify as a horror guy, you love the Scream movies. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I love the Scream movies. And, you know, when I say I'm not a horror guy, it's like I don't go to venture to see every horror movie. It's like a horror movie has to have a, like really good reviews and be really hyped up for me to be like, OK, yeah, I'll go see that. But the Scream movies they i uh, hold a very special place in my heart it's like i movies i kind of grew up with so. yeah so yeah. what is it why the scream movies versus all other horror franchises what is it about them i the thing about i mean particularly the first scream movie it is yes it has some genuinely scary moments it has a lot of humor to it it has a lot of characters who are relatable and identifiable and you, who you remember who stick out in your mind um, it's a healthy, fun dose of 90s nostalgia, which someone my age really does appreciate. Um, it just so happened to have been filmed not far from where I live, which is pretty fun. Um, and it's just and all the self-referential humor kind of breaking down and in a way sort of uh, kind of identifying things that I don't tend to like about slasher movies and still playing into them and sort of justifying them that way. And just sort of playing with the audience in a really fun way. It it doesn't really feel like uh like a horror movie when I watch it. It feels like just a really really fun experience. But I know horror fans love the m- movies too, so it seems to it really branches out with the Phantom of Scream. I found great. So if you can then give us a bit of a a quick summary on what you make of the first four, and could you lead that then into your rating per our rating system of Scream 5 and just give us your sort of overview review? Oh, boy. Do you want rating systems for all four of them? <laughs> or a rate, rating no, just, for all just, right. just generally how you liked them. <laughs> I mean, Scream is, like, untouchable. I love that movie to death. I watch it at least, I'd, I'd say once a year, maybe more, but I've seen it many, many times. It kind of 
perfectly encapsulates everything that I love about the series. Scream 2 has really great ideas to it. There are really great scenes and set pieces, but I'll be honest, I do get kind of annoyed by the college campus atmosphere to it. That It just verges a little too much into things that I don't like about 90s pop culture, like a, sort of a little, uh, like too much never been kissed. The scene in the cafeteria where Jerry O'Connell sings, I think I love you to Sydney, makes me want to tear my eyeballs out. I cannot stand that scene. It's like, what is this doing in this Scream movie? It's So yeah, scenes like that play out a lot in Scream 2, which keeps it in my mind from being as good as I feel like a lot of people think it is or feel it is. But it's still a movie I revisit frequently, so I certainly can't say I dislike it. Scream 3, I like more than most people. I I think the scene where she is in the on the set of um the stab three movie and gets attacked by the killer that i that's a mind-blowing scene that i love i think it is a highlight of the series it really like and there are a lot of like scenes like really creepy moments like that in that movie that does kind of make up for its minor shortcomings here and there but i do i do find that i like scream three a lot more than most people seem to a lot of people call that like the the lame duck of the series scream four. I loved when I saw it at a midnight opening in theaters. I loved it. I thought it was, Oh, so cool. Such a fun new direction. They took it in and uh, like who could have seen that killer coming. So I had a really, I had a really great time watching that for the first time, but every time I've tried to rewatch it, it just kind of loses its, its muster. I think it verges a little too far into the comedy realm for it to really work for me as a scream movie. So it is probably my least favorite, but uh I did just watch it, rewatch it a couple of days ago just because I hadn't seen it in a while. So uh and yeah, I still kind of feel that way, but there's a lot of good stuff to it too. Scream 2022 or Scream 5 or Scream the Return or whatever you want to call it. I was I loved it. I loved the hell out of it. It made me so happy. It was exactly the Scream movie that I was hoping for and was like wanting for all these years. I have seen it twice so far. My first time was normally. My second time was D-Box. We can talk about D-Box later, but I've I've seen the movie twice. And uh, I enjoyed it just as much the second time because there's a lot of fun clues that you see throughout that uh, lead to the potential result. This is 100% a, a buy for me. Maybe not a double buy, but I um, I was very pleased with Scream 2022. It made me happy. <laughs> Great. Right. Timothy. Yes, sir. <laughs> scream movies and scream. Oh man. Uh I would say I would put the scream movies in this order including Scream 2022. <laughs> scream 1 number 1, no problem. Uh I think I like number 4 best next. Hmm. Then number two, well, then maybe this one. So this most recent screen, five, whatever. Then probably two, then three. I think that's the order I would stick to. Um, I, uh, I enjoyed this one, but... There were enough little like head tilting things for me where I just was like, oh, are we, mm, is that really what we're going to do here? <laughs> that I I felt a little not psyched. I, I, I had a good time watching it. I think there's a lot of good stuff in it, but I didn't walk out going, holy shit, that is, that was an amazing Scream movie. It c- was close. It like it was knocking on the door for me, but didn't quite hit it. I I can kind of mirror you pretty spot on, except for rather than say didn't walk out feeling it was a great screen movie. It was more I could say I walked out thinking it was a fun, great time, but not maybe the sort of high I had when I left Scream 4 when it originally came out. Yeah, yeah. But I don't... I'm just sort of going to claim um, first viewing just whatever. Because, like, I can't rem- remember now if we're 
Scream 2 and 3 and I guess even 4 if like uh, they were as shocking as I remember or, you know, I really wasn't guessing things along the way or any of my sort of maybe minor experiential qualms with i mean maybe it was just that i saw scream four in a packed house and then saw this new one in like a near empty theater (laughs) so i i don't know and i'm really just interested to talk to you guys about it but because it's a scream movie and i think i'll always just buy them to complete the collection (laughs) i'm technically a buy it um but Uh, i'd say more Hmm. more just kind of I don't know, like for sure, for sure, rent it. I don't know, but hey, this is how our rating system works. We have to clarify it, but it's technically a buy it. I think that, oh man. Ah, I don't actually know what I would rate it then. <laughs> like, I feel like you just buy it because <laughs> why wouldn't you? What would you tell exactly. yourself to? Exactly. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. We can I mean, come back at the end of the I'm show. If I'm going to buy the first one, which I definitely would, I would just buy all of them. So, look, I guess that's a weird way of saying that I don't think any any of them are bad enough not to own. Like, I don't even really, I don't like three. Like, <laughs> I'm like always very bleh about three. I just re- Part I thought, of it is yeah. Courtney Cox's hair. <laughs> no that's not it <laughs> you know but they were making fun of that it. on the drew barrymore show they had them right. all on and they showed a picture i'm like i actually like i think it looks kind of cute i don't know <laughs> it didn't bother me the way it seems about i think she's making way too much out of it sure sure yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay so i'm a buy too but here's here's my question can we just recap who the killers of all of the previous four movies were please sure i think right. this is important for context all right so I obvious I remember the first one very well. I've seen that one far more than any of the others. I assume you guys are probably in the same camp. Pretty much. Yeah. So okay, so the killers and the motive are Billy Loomis, who is Sidney Prescott's boyfriend, and his friend Stu Mocker. Their motive is that Billy's dad <laughs> Am I going to get this right? Billy's dad was the dude that Sydney's mom had an affair with, correct? Mm-hmm. Yes. And then what happened? That Caused made... his family to break up because of that. Okay. And that's it? Like it, His mother abandoned him. He was... Uh, okay, okay. Yeah, like okay. he I guess was left alone from that. Yeah. Destroyed his family. That's pretty <laughs> lame. I mean, I <laughs> like for him to be that upset over though remember like we talked about in our scream episode in the 90s bubble world like (laughs) you know that sure i think that works there's tracks i it tracks i think it works but i'm saying he's lame (laughs) yeah i mean we know that from how he how he treats uh sydney exactly straight up so i think that's a kill for that it's, (laughs) it's an important sort of uh recurring truism to the killers i think okay so and number Stu. two well and Stu, yeah his friend is there he thinks that they're going to be famous because of it he's just, sort of his he says what does he along? say moral support peer pressure i'm right. far too sensitive oh, right. i think is what he says <laughs> yeah. okay um you know great number two is billy's mom billy loomis's mom mrs loomis debbie and Mickey Altieri, who's Timothy Oliphant. Mm-hmm. What's his deal? He was a crazed like Quentin Tarantino like fan, right? <laughs> yeah, he said like he's going to. Well, I don't know if this is mo- his motive. Well, I, I don't, I can't remember how they met or what. But he says he's right. going to blame the movies, um, and he's going to get. Uh, apparently, Bob Dole was really into violence in the media and condemning <laughs> yeah. that, so he was going to align himself with that. And like, yeah, fine. So yeah. And so <laughs> Mrs. Loomis really kind of has like recruited him, I guess, right? Yeah. To, because she's mad that Sydney killed her son. That one, you know, I think that that's legit. I mean, it's it's you're like unhinged, but great. Okay, so we're still so so. Still got Loomis's Lumen here. (laughs) Number three, the killer is Roman Bridger. Single killer, 
What's his issue? Okay, he apparently recruited the um the original two killers to carry that out because Sydney w- oh, wait, no. We get, <laughs> wait. No. <laughs> Sydney was getting too much publicity and he was her brother and he was mad about that but the timeline uh, what no, i just said the timeline doesn't quite right work out, he's so. like the estranged brother who's like her, his mom had uh an affair with someone i guess when she was in hollywood she had a stint in hollywood yes so he's sydney's half brother who then when his mom left hollywood just just left him behind okay uh yes that I I'll, I'll just say I remember seeing that movie in theaters and that ending landed with a total thud more than any of the others. Agreed. So I, like that. <laughs> I remember. I it. D- I couldn't. I couldn't even. Who who is this guy? Oh, he, what? No, like I didn't even know who well, he was. Well, isn't they... in that one he, he, we we meet him for like thirty seconds in one scene and then like not until the end. Essentially, he's in a couple of scenes, but he's just not a memorable enough character yeah. for it to really mean anything when it happens. Um, okay, so. fair week number four (laughs) it's official (laughs) number four (laughs) the killers are jill roberts who is sydney's niece (laughs) and her boyfriend no i thought it was or it's just it's rory culkin yeah just another guy he's just one of their in the past okay the jamie kennedy stand-in or the um or the the randy yes 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 Okay, his name was Charlie Walker. Now, this one really is. I thought sort it was, of, they were cousins, right? Or is it niece? I don't remember. Okay. Niece. It's, yeah, okay, I think it's niece, niece, right? Yeah. Okay, so and her, she also wants. She's she's jealous of her fame. Is a big right, part of it. Yeah, she's got survivor jeal. No, she's got. Well, she's jealous that Sydney survived and got publicity for it. And so she's constructed this whole thing to be a survivor of new ghost faces. And she frames her. She That's who the boyfriend is. She frames her boyfriend, I think. Right. In the end, she's set it up to make it look like he's one of the killers and that she. Yes. Yes. Had, she like beats like, herself up like yeah. fight club style yeah, in yeah, the living yeah. room. Yeah. Right. OK. So not far off from the previous movie, actually, as her brother was. um uh jealous of the publicity and now she's jealous right of the okay so then we we get to number five i mean s- spoiler <laughs> like should yeah. we even should we <laughs> dive in or should we just say what it is you wanted to set okay. the stage here <laughs> okay. so I, don't know. I, I think we should just say what it is yeah okay people have heard it or so watched it Jeez. <laughs> okay so the killers in this one are well now i don't remember their names jesus uh let's see uh not amber yes amber uh who's a high school student who is friends with the sis this it's convoluted (laughs) she's friends with the sister of billy loomis's child Mm mm-hmm who didn't really know she was Billy Loomis's child until she was a bit older. Yeah. Right. Okay. And who knew that Billy had a kid, right? Yeah. He knocked yeah. he knocked somebody that. up in high school before the events of the first scream. Yeah, it's ironic considering his motive uh for the killings like oh he's a home wrecker too or, or right. well yeah something like that. Well, he Maybe is. not a home wrecker. Sort of, <laughs> yeah, I mean I, by chain of events He's okay. abandoning someone, so... And, okay, yeah. so, yeah. Right. It's her and a super fan, essentially. Like a Reddit thread mm-hmm. fanfic <laughs> super fan dude who is mad that the Stab movies have have sort of derailed from what the, the original, the greatness of the original. Yes, they believe that uh, in order to restore it, you have to... The best ones were always based on actual events, so they want to make those actual events. Okay. So they can make, yeah, make the new movie based on, yeah, right. And so the movie we're watching, basically. Yeah, so so Amber's motivation is sort of adjacent to that fandom thing in that she... What's her issue? Like, why is she so upset? 
<laughs> um, I feel like we should save this for a different <laughs> What didn't work <laughs> right now. Right? Okay, fair All enough. Right. So, but it is sort of, it is a little bit in line of this. It's It's sort of based in jealousy and like wanting attention which which every movie has essentially that is the killer's motivation and any kind of like clarifications about uh what lines were how the order happened what people's motivations were for this film i'm gonna look to you peter because you've seen it twice <laughs> i'll try fair. yeah I know, right? fair i've only seen it once <laughs> <laughs> twice and, and uh do you want to, do we want to say when we're recording this <laughs> I don't care. It opened on Thursday night. It's now Sunday. I've seen it twice. So that's okay. <laughs> that's fair. Oh, right. <laughs> okay, cool. I think that's all good establishing stuff. Let's talk about the story. Okay, our summary. Yes. <laughs> all right. Who wants to do it? Peter, I oh, guess. Oh, Re- Really? <laughs> I don't know. You both have computers in front of you. Um, uh, okay. Um, summary. If you need help with names, we're here. Yeah, I'm definitely going to need that. Um, okay, how detailed do we go? All right, so there's um, uh, a girl played by Jenna Ortega. Her name is what? Tara. Tara. Her name is Tara. She gets harassed on the phone, s- similar to Drew Barrymore in the opening scene. Um, it turns out she survives the attack. Her sister hears about it, her older sister, who sh- they've been estranged for a while because her older sister got into drugs and whatnot. Um, she hears about it and goes to visit her. Uh, and when she goes to visit her, she confesses that the reason why she's been weird around her is because she found out that uh, Billy Loomis, a serial killer, was her father and her mother never told her about it and that led to just a complete uh, destruction of their relationship. Um, Then uh, there is another attack on a guy who is harassing one of the female characters. I can't remember which one it was, but that was Kyle. (laughs) Kyle Gallner was the actor who played him. I don't think we need every kill. We don't need to just. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) I don't know. I'm literally going through this like scene by scene, but yeah. Uh, Something between a summary and an IMDb summary. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Yeah. We'll be here all day. Won't we? All night. Um, Okay. Yeah. So then like more, more attacks happen and whatnot. Uh, eventually, uh, the original three get roped in. Um, Dewey sadly gets killed in one of the attacks uh, in the hospital. Then everything ends up at Stu Mocker's house. Um, which, <laughs> and we find out at a big party because there's always a big party. Then, uh, when, uh, then a couple more people get killed or maybe get killed. We find out later that they didn't. And, um, <laughs> My God, where am I at now? Uh, then it's revealed that it's uh, actually Amber who's the killer and kills somebody in that sense. Then it turns out, oh, yeah, they say never trust the love interest. And sure enough, the love interest of um, uh, Melissa Barrera. Um, what's what's her name? What's her name? Uh, the main character. The main character. <laughs> Sam. Sam. <laughs> Sam's boyfriend. Jack Chip. Quaid. Chip. <laughs> Richie. Chip. Richie. Richie. <laughs> Chip. Uh, they <laughs> is the other killer. They have been uh, collaborating with each other on things like 4chan and Reddit and uh, to set this whole elaborate scheme up to repair the Stab franchise because everyone really hated Stab 8, a clear nod to Ryan Johnson's The Last Jedi. And uh, then... Um, yeah, Dewey. Do, uh, yeah, I mentioned Dewey got killed. I'm doing horribly at this card. Um, uh, then, yeah, there's some more kills, and uh, Amber <laughs> and um, Rich eventually meet their demise, and they move forward. And a couple of people are still alive and uh, set up for Scream Six. How'd I? How'd I do? <laughs> Great. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Anything to add? That's important, Tim. Probably um... a lot. <laughs> Well, from a care there, so like setting the scene of w- the current Woodsboro realm world that we're in, we've got returning characters. The sheriff, Judy Hicks, is yeah. So Judy oh has yeah. taken over the sheriff's role from Dewey, who has retired. Mm-hmm. Dewey and Gale are no longer together. Um, 
uh, Sydney is, you know, living living a life. She's off jogging with a baby. Yeah, yeah. she's she's got her shit under control <laughs> elsewhere. Um, and then we get some tie-ins. We've got the twins who are Randy's niece and nephew. Um, they're part of this friend group that that is Tara, Amber. The two of them and one of the twins' girlfriend, whose name I don't remember. Um, she kind of just disappears in the movie. I don't think she has a single line in that movie. Was it Mindy? Oh, Liv. 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 Yeah, yeah she's, she's barely, barely in it. Um, so you do get this new crew of, of teenagers. Um, and then, obviously, you get Sam and her boyfriend, who, what are we saying? They're about 22-ish? Sure. Maybe they're yeah. out of... They're supposed to be, like, five they... years older, I guess. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. So, 22-ish, if if all the high schoolers are 17. Um, and... Oh, and there's one other friend in there, Wes. Um, <laughs> obviously, uh, a callback to or homage, whatever you call it, um, named after Wes Craven. And uh, he's the son of Judy Hicks, the sheriff. So those are sort of our players, right? Is that, am I missing somebody? Everyone's related no, to I everyone. Think that, I think that's it. <laughs> oh, um, I, I do want to, since you mentioned Wes, uh, Sam Carpenter is her last name, if I'm not wrong. Yes, so, it yes, is. For John Carpenter. So yeah. There we go. Well, and so, as far as if we're <laughs> linking characters to, um, yes, we mentioned... She was the, um, or you could say we have the re- return of Billy Loomis in, uh, oh, right. <laughs> in ghost form. In Sam's, hallucination uh, form. Sam's hallucination. That's true. I guess that is an important factor. Sam is is having psychotic or, yeah, hallucinations of some psychotic nature, and she's taking some sort of medication to curb that. But we do get vi- she gets visited by Billy's specter, yeah, which at sort various of various times. It sort mm-hmm. of adds the through line of when they you know presenting the idea of she may be the killer. It sort of is a way to maybe mm-hmm. explain that while we're watching it, right? Oh, um, Vince, who's Vince? He's the weird like the is that Kyle Gellner? Yeah, yeah, he's the guy with the mustache who gets uh, killed early on at the right, bar. Right, right, the shady right, right. guy. Oh yeah, so yeah, he's yeah he's one of the early kills. He was revealed to be Stu Mocker's nephew as well. So that's another which, there you which go. I missed Tie the in. first time I saw it. I didn't catch that till yeah, the second yeah, yeah, yeah. time. I, I, yeah, I was like, it was a bit of a throwaway, but they're like, oh, they're yeah. going after people, you know, related to the first murders is right. sort of the what they, you know key in on do we have to wait to like scream seven to get like all the weathers involved in it because courtney cox is the only (laughs) one who's like kind of on her own doesn't (laughs) they haven't had any kids as far as we know so there's like yeah probably ends with uh weathers riley right there yeah yeah okay so i think that pretty well covers it cool um sorry the twins are named chad and (laughs) something else mindy I yep. think Chad and Mindy. Yeah. Okay. okay. If that's helpful. Great. All right. Got our summary. Got our characters. Let's go. Got our connections. I think that means that we have who the killers are of the first four films. <laughs> uh, I think that means we're set for our first big section here. The meat and potatoes, so to speak. What worked? What worked? What worked for you? It worked like a charm, Smith. I mean, Tim, I feel like we almost got to just pick up after our last discussion of the four Scream films. Do you remember, I was thinking about this and I meant to look it up. We posited uh, ideas of what the the, this movie could be about. Do you remember what what, what we said? The, I, only remember something that we said that wasn't good, which was <laughs> the idea that it would be like multiple killers kind of like across the world um, oh. coordinating. <laughs> but, That'll be Scream 10. Yeah, probably. we had other, but we were trying to come at it from a, well, what would it say about horror nowadays? And I forget what we specifically said, 
But I thought that's exactly would be interesting to set off is uh, pinpointing that question that we had that we now have the answer for, which was if, you know, these movies are always in conversation with horror films. This one, we had the triage is how I counted it of commentary on requels or whatever mm-hmm. you want to call them. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, quote, unquote, elevated horror references to <laughs> right. that. And then last but not least, toxic fandom. Yes. I think that's great. I mean, I was really psyched that these sort of ideas were, you know, a part of the character's world and conversation. Like that, I felt like it felt appropriate to a Scream movie. Yeah, it's so satisfying exactly because you think that's exactly what we were trying to pause it 10 years later. Where are we at? How are things different? And just boom, 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 those three. Yeah. I, I thought, I mean, I can't, I kind of wish I had re-listened to that episode. I listened to it a year ago when he did it. But yeah, it would have been cool to compare that. But but yeah, uh, when they say at the very beginning, what's your favorite scary movie? And she says, The Baba Duke." right there. It just kind of, like the light bulb went off in my head. Yeah, horror is really different today than it was 20 years ago, 25 years ago. And uh, by the way, as someone who, you know, I said earlier, I'm not a huge horror guy, but if something gets great reviews, I'll do it. All those movies they name checked in that first scene, The Babadook, It Follows, um, uh, The Witch, Hereditary. And Hereditary. Yeah. I've seen all of those and I'm very <laughs> proud to be able to say like, yeah, I made good choices there. I, um, I guess this is more a compliment to scream for and how it is ahead of the time with just getting out of the way the idea of the social media star and doing something for stardom yeah. so i feel like if that didn't have that then we might not have gotten to the idea of toxic fandom for mm-hmm. this one which was fresh new territory to explore that was fun here it's yeah toxic fa- that's a very relevant with with every movie that's out there it's such a big part of what how movies are made right now like studios are listening to what people say on twitter this just makes uh, it's a very different like situation we have right now yeah. to compared to just 10 years ago but it's there's i mean release the snyder cut is a positive thing you know out of that i'd say yeah yeah that's well i never saw that but i i trust that that is well a, i mean you were just posing it as yeah. the the fans as certainly have a say nowadays and i was just pointing out that can be good or yeah. bad or i but i guess here the the idea is more uh the amount at which they care the right. love turning into something where you'd um <laughs> resort to violence and murder <laughs> to defend that love of something it's pretty extreme out there <laughs> well yeah. but it is i mean i really felt it it landed because it it evokes exactly the feeling that you get when you go on twitter mm-hmm. and you like go down these like comment threads of just people just the vitriolic like insanity that you you can you know tumble around within in 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 the reddit or the twitter sphere and it's it's wild it's like upsetting yeah (laughs) disturbing and like i feel like this movie was able to tap into the at least the feeling that you get when you're like experiencing that stuff so you're pointing out yeah you can experience it from the being able to view the toxicity of halloween kills ruin michael myers for me or whatever (laughs) but i I think when it clicked for me was when I was able to identify with the other perspective of feeling that fandom, which happened for me in the moment, because that's important too to help, you know, sell the killers or whatever. But the moment, and maybe this is the only moment for me that sort of did it, but was when you see the footage of Stab 8, you know, they're <laughs> yeah. describing how terrible it is. And I'm just imagining like, I, I mean, it's just, it's, it's so they have him like, you know, shooting a, is what he has like a, the, a metal mask and is shooting yeah. a flamethrower, yeah. <laughs> which is like hilarious and great. And in a way, I'd kind of love that too. But, uh, and, you know, of course, I love like Leprechaun, of course, that's just silly. It's allowed to go to space. And Jason, <laughs> you know, Friday the 13th are silly. So that doesn't ruin it for me. But it's the goes to space equivalent. But when it is something that's more like rooted in, I guess, in the world of the movie, actual killings, I can get how that would be a part of that love and fandom for you that it's, you know, has a relation to these serious heavy events. So then 
it is almost a sort of slap in the face to have metal ghost face shooting a flamethrower in that sense. So I don't know, just just seeing how horrible <laughs> the fate of the the stab films. That was the one moment where I almost kind of like, oh God, you know, I can see the toxic fandom in me in that way, maybe. Yeah, I mean, there is this element of of like what is precious and should it be and like what's when is it too like when are you considering a thing too precious like for example (laughs) i remember going to like i grew up reading as we well know reading comic books and spider-man was a big one wolverine was a big one x-men but i remember going to the first wolverine movie called wolverine origins (laughs) and and being really upset, like, because I just was like, not only is this not, like, kind of what I was hoping it would be, but it's just a bad, bad movie. And I felt, like, betrayed in a way or something like that. I just was like, I don't, like, I don't want this. I don't want to even be here. I don't, like, one of the few times I actually considered just leaving a, a, a theater because I was like, this is just so not what I would have hoped it for. And so that you know magnifying that feeling i think is what a lot of people experience like i'm not gonna lose my shit over it but i was upset in a sort of disappointed way yeah and i think that people you know they they this is maybe a bigger conversation about the world today or maybe the world has always been like humans have always been this way but just how dear and precious people consider certain art or just anything it could be a sports team it could be a musician whatever whatever it may be but like attaching yourself and importance to that thing on such a such a deep level when does that become toxic and whose responsibility is it in the creation of anything related to that thing that you consider precious to like try to consider your position on it i think there is a line because like i want to make the comparison to like what is that feeling we feel so deeply that you felt when wolverine didn't come out good it's if that character is so so important with you it's almost like you just want other people to experience a little bit of what that may feel may feel like like if it was a good Wolverine movie, you might be able to show someone important to you or the rest of the world all of a sudden gets Wolverine and it's exciting and it, it reinforces that love. Right. So where I'm going is like to compare that to not actually people, but like when you lose someone, a person's, you know, like, you know, they, they pass away. It's that's where that pain can, you know, is feels so rooted and it feels like is no one will ever get to know, you know, all this all that made this person wonderful. They won't ever get to experience them the same way I did. They'll never know things that made them special. And that's, you know, I don't know. That's at I least what I did with as hurting. Yeah, yeah, in a in a more pure way. Yes. So so that but the next step that seems to happen in the world that we uh, are in now is that the disappointment or anger or whatever in in the loss of that thing or or just it not being what you wanted it to be gets turned back around onto the creator Mm. and i think that's really the core problem i guess with this toxic fandom sort of thing it's like they're they yes they did not deliver what you wanted but they're they're different than you Mm -hmm. they're a different person and they're doing what they think is best (laughs) now you can disagree on the outcome but should you go after them in the way that like we see people go after i mean directors or writers we went after i slash we went after so hard the studio behind uh the new grudge movie you know it's (laughs) like there was toxic Uh, fandom on my part you know yes yes but we are Yes, that's true. Well, it's an interesting he, fine line. But so that's what that was was getting to with your question was what is that line? Yeah. And I think that is that line. You know, we have that distinguishment bet- distinguishment between a character and a story and a you know a, a world property, whatever you want to call it. And then that example I gave of someone's life or even you know a, a pet's life or something or a place even you know something grounded in our physical reality. Yeah. Um. 
that when it crosses a line of sort of somehow, and it doesn't have to be physical, like in <laughs> Scream 5, Scream 2022, sure. but as soon as you're inflicting something on the pain spectrum, you know, because of that, <laughs> that fandom and not getting to share that of them getting the Wolverine movie wrong or whatever, <laughs> that's when it crosses the line is if a person's going to be hurt somehow, you know? Or death threats on Twitter, or violence <laughs> yeah. threats on right, Twitter. Right. Like, exactly. like when it gets to the point of, or, or racist or misogynistic comments on Twitter because you didn't like whatever that person created. I mean, that yeah, that's that's where it gets to when it gets to violent language or violent. Uh, uh, and it's just so fast. In the, I think, you, yeah, as you said, it, it happens instantly with all different types of opinions and ideas that float out there. I mean, people will get called the most horrible things in the world if someone has even a slightly different opinion from them. And... Of course, when it comes to movies, which are n- aren't as in the grand scheme of things, aren't as important as a lot of other things that are going around, that just makes people go that much harder, that much quicker when it comes to that kind of anger on Twitter. Yeah, so it's uh, yeah. I think it's fascinating. I mean, I really like. I remember watching a. I don't. Know, it must have been a documentary or something quite a long time ago about what's called a parasocial relationship, and essentially that's like when a fan has a connection to a character or an actor, but typically it'd be like a character. So it's like, you know, you watch Seinfeld and you've watched it so much that you think you know Jerry Seinfeld. You mm. you you form what feels like an actual relationship with this character so much so that you, on some level, believe that you know that person. Mm-hmm. You don't. And they definitely don't know you. But you feel like you have this connection, and that's a really powerful thing that is very common. And you see, like, I when I was younger, I dated a a, a woman who was on a soap opera, oh. and like when she would walk out of the studio, there would be people standing there calling her by her character's name, like <laughs> talking to her as the character. And it was real. like I would just sort of stand back and like watch this and be like, whoa, this is weird, you know, because they must know, right, that she's this person in real life, not the character. But they are just kind of ignoring that fact and because they're so wrapped up in the thing. And so to me, I'm like, there's something quite beautiful about the idea that you love, you know, an artistic expression that much. That you, that you feel this connection to it, and I I think that there's a positive element to that, but it so quickly can slip into something very negative, <laughs> and I think the connectivity of our world, Twitter and and social media and and such, has become this weird petri dish for that toxicity, and like sometimes there's really beautiful, positive, non toxic versions of this in those realms but it feels like the other thing is more common well speaking of connectivity to (laughs) worlds um something i loved about this one was kind of what we went through was those fun little connections to mainly the original scream like it's I, i mean going into it i was like did they kind of do it all by the fourth one? <laughs> like how many more, like, you know, more, more direct, not so tenuous connections can we make here between who parented who and who's the sibling to who and all that. <laughs> but the way that they pulled it off really had me sold. It was fun. Scream a new generation. Yeah. It's uh, and the way that the opening scene still manages to play out very similar beats to the first movie between the question she's being asked, but also like at almost the exact same point in the conversation, she pulls the knife out of the mm-hmm. little, little thing. What I don't know what it's called. The block, the knife block at almost the exact same point, just like Drew Barrymore did in the first one. So it just, I, I mean, I don't know what that really means necessarily, but it still <laughs> felt like a fresh take. So yeah, it's a requel. It's a, a remake. And this is the point where they finally got to that. I mean, scream four is like, just so self-referential and self uh, self parody in a way, which results in a, yeah, a pretty fun time. But this was the point. It kind of bridges the gap between the originals and now this 
requel that we have. So yeah, it does. I mean, hearing you put it that way makes me kind of realize Scream 4 was still a bit too close to the other ones to not yeah. do the whole like, it's a generation later. It's about right. all the kids. So it's really it's a trip watching this one thinking like how the high schoolers in this one, the main characters are talking about the old killings, like how we, and the old stab movies, right. like how we are reflecting on the screen movies in our lives. And it's all our, you know, we're the parents and they're the kids. It's just, I don't know. It was tripping me out in that, that sense. That self-referential like aspect, I think is so, so strong in this because it is the thing. Like any anytime you're, if you're doing a movie where you have to have people like, understanding the rules of a horror movie or any movie how do you frame it better than in the first one by you know having a guy who works in a video store hmm. be like okay everybody just so you know like here's how it goes but this it, this is able to do it plus a bunch more because they're not just being like oh horror movies are this and this is what we have to look out for they're they're talking about all like movie entertainment at yeah. this point and talking about like what goes into a requill and what that even is and like part of me i wanted to think oh that's where they're kind of it's hand holding the audience but it's not it doesn't play that way i think it plays really well quite the, well, well the goal is to meet the audience where they're at and right. then some a little bit that's kind of you know on every level yeah well that's some i mean they still Something that I like about this movie that I feel like doesn't quite work in Scream 4 for me is it feels it still feels grounded in reality. These feel like real people talking the way real people talk. And the way it's filmed is uh, like kind of a throwback to the original. It's filmed in a very realistic way without like, I mean, the fourth one had really bright colors and uh a lot like more zippy sort of MTV like direction in a way that it, <laughs> it felt like a little removed from reality in that way. Whereas this, it felt very back to basics, like something you could walk into. And yeah, like the rules of the recall, which he says, even Star Wars. Like, yeah, I feel like Star Wars kind of kicks that off with The Force Awakens. Maybe maybe something did it before that. But that's when I first really noticing The Force Awakens. So it's basically just another way of telling the story of A New Hope again. And they're just, that's just become a thing with like The Matrix Resurrections and yeah. uh um, of course, nothing else coming to mind right now, yeah. but it's it's a real trend right now. Yeah. Uh, it was interesting what you said there about just kind of describing the style. And yeah. this was this was something that I kind of flip flopped on where at first I'm like, is this something is this a reason why this isn't working for me? Mm -hmm. But then I realized maybe more than like just thinking about it since. No, this is something that is working. And that's the fact it was throwing me off at first that it wasn't a Wes Craven movie. It wasn't like the other ones. It did not have the look and feel of the other ones, you know, and as those went on, I mean, maybe that was just sort of the nature of, you know, a filmmaker closer to his time with the first one is going to better reflect the reality of the nineties, just matching with the filmmaking style. Mm. And by the fourth one, I don't know. So, but I love all, you know, the one through four so much the style though, maybe like what you're getting at it's it bridges further even though it's bridging further from reality it's still you're enjoying it like i'm in the scream world right mm -hmm. like it's, it's the feel it's the look of it everything that west craven brings to it so you know immediately when you're watching this new one i'm like this is different and i don't know what to make of it but i realize in the end that's a good thing and that is working on that I guess them, them, we haven't said the word yet, but it's working on that meta level. <clears throat> it's working on that meta level where the, um, oh yeah, where I realize like that's a good thing because we are so far separated from it now that you don't want it to be like the originals. That would feel even more almost out of place. Not that I'm down, he couldn't do it. It would still be great. But I think for where we're at and what we're saying about horror movies and doing a fifth one and treating it as a requill, which a reboot is built into that, it is kind of built in to the bones to have it be different filmmakers and have that work for it, you know? I, I, I liked the look of yeah. this movie a lot. Like, I felt, I don't know, I felt in good hands, I guess. Just from a aesthetic and sort of 
pacing point of view i was like i like the coloring i like mm. the shot selection i like the vibe of the world like it still feels like woodsboro but it, it feels modern right so which it, is important right like we oh. it is it is it's literally what would woodsboro be now yeah and and i felt like they managed to to kind of bridge that gap between the woodsboro that we knew and what it would potentially turn into in the modern world modern world like it was a hundred years ago but <laughs> like you know what I mean. yeah it, it yeah the, the colors were a little drab i liked that about it it felt dark it felt like a gloomy thing it felt like this was a real scary situation they were in even though they had a lot of funny lines and things to laugh at it's it felt it, the the horror worked for me this time there wasn't really a distance to it it felt like uh yeah i i felt for the characters it 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 hit home for me. It, so, it yeah. also, I think it felt emotionally grounded too, mm -hmm. which yeah. is important. Whereas maybe the fourth one got a little flippant in, in sort of its own self-referential or like self-parody realm of like it's almost everything's a little bit of a joke. This one did not feel like that. If I, I mean, I felt like, oh, Dewey's having a really hard time yeah you know right. like yeah. like life is hard <laughs> yeah. and yet there's still a charm that the first one in particular possessed that i thought carried through this one like the fact that we like we see dewey we meet him at a pretty low spot you know there's liquor bottles all over the place he looks rough mm -hmm. but then he's watching gail's morning show Aww. and there's something just like charming and sweet and sad but like endearing about all of that so like being able to have both that kind of uh what would be the word for it i'm not exactly sure it, it, it's light-hearted and deeply grounded emotionally grounded at the same time which is he's actually a, i think kind of hard to pull off it's that he's a character and he's a person right but having the context of who he is or who he was and seeing him where he is now i think really you know lets us feel all of those things on both sides of it when he struggles over that text message that's yeah. that's such a great moment so i mean like uh, I mean, yeah, the, the way the text messaging has become such a part of filmmaking now, there is something that it that can be not only relatable, but also very, very well, nicely visual in expressing people's feelings. And that I just I liked that moment there. Yeah, the, I mean, when they do get on screen together, I loved that scene just to talk about Dewey and some of the charm of the originals carrying through to this one. Yeah, the Gail Dewey thing. They had their one big reunion scene together. And just when they slipped right back into their calling each other out and knowing each other so well, bickering mode, it was like right at home. It was great. I loved that scene. I, I mean, I. I think not that I've consumed Courtney Cox like, uh, you know, whatever you call it, the uh, movies and TV shows she's been in on a high level, but th sh her acting in that scene is very good, like very very good, like to the point where I was like, oh man, <laughs> Courtney Cox showed up, like yeah. she showed up and is like giving a really really great deep emotionally grounded performance, like. Cool. Yeah. yeah. The two of them, they really kill it here. I mean, they're, they're, it's one of my problems with some of the earlier movies is I did get a little bit annoyed with some of their banter in oh the earlier ones. Yeah. yeah like at they, times, sure. There were times where they could be kind of my least favorite parts of the movie, but there's, yeah, they've been I, through a lot. They're a lot more relatable is it, this time around. I think it's three where there's like a whole sequence where it's like a buddy cop movie between the two of them. And it's just like, guys, what are we well, doing? That well, was kind of great. It's Gail with her, the Gail actor with Parker Posey playing uh, Gail Weathers. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. pretty fun. Yeah, yeah that's right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's uh, you might be t uh, the part where they break into the school together in Scream 2 that I don't maybe know that's, that's what the, it yeah, is. Yeah. Like, that like when that when the movie becomes theirs, mm. it kind of runs off. <laughs> that, I remember rails, that back yeah. when Scream 3 came out, it was like a critique where it felt like the Gail Dewey show in a way. Yeah. 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 Uh, well, Peter, for, for this one, I mean, I just kind of was excited to 
set us off on the thread and looking at my notes here, but I mean, just reset a little bit, like what mm-hmm. worked for you about this? What was your experience going oh into this God. and your yeah. like, <laughs> where were your expectations at and at what point were they exceeded? She, okay. I really tried to go in this cold. I watched the teaser trailer, I think when it first came out one time and got really excited about it. Didn't remember much about it beyond that. I mean, that trailer we watched earlier, I'm quite certain I have not seen that. So, um, the opening moment, Jenna Ortega just uh, she kills it. The way her presence on that screen, the way that she converses and the way that she reacts and the the pain you see in her when she gets attacked and the fear she that is one of the better scream queen performances I have seen in a long to ever. I, I think she really and it felt very modern, too. I mean, Drew Barrymore is brilliant in that one scene she has. And then uh, she basically brings a modern sensibility to a very similar scene. And uh, yeah, taking out the phone and turning the, turning the locks on. And I didn't even know that was something you could do. Apparently that's (laughs) something that homes have now. (laughs) Um, uh, But yeah, there there's that. And um, getting introduced to all these new characters, some, well, yeah, most of them really worked for me. (laughs) We will get to the rest later. Um, but uh, getting to know these new characters, experiencing the style and seeing these uh, kills for the first time and seeing that um, Mikey Madison, who uh, someone who is uh, is basically the star of one of my favorite scenes in the history of film from <laughs> Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Uh, that makes me that made me very happy that she was in it. Um, and just getting the flavor of these uh, a more grounded, realistic version of Scream that I didn't really get from the last movie. It made me super happy. There were um, when it gets to Stu Mocker's house, I felt like I had kind of figured that out beforehand, but it still didn't. It still kind of worked when there had that big like floating through the house reveal of where they were. It was very Star Wars as well. The the scene between Gail and Dewey, it did remind me a lot of when Han and Leia meet in The Force Awakens. I couldn't I couldn't <laughs> not have that in my mind when that happened. But but yeah, the kills were more a lot of them more gruesome. I don't know if that's because we have better technology now or because filmmakers just have uh dirty like crazier minds now, but the way the knife would just go through and come out the other end of um Wes. of Wes's yeah. neck. That was that was brutal, but it just getting, getting to guess and wonder who the killers were again after, after so many years of not being able to see a movie where I could experience that and seeing their motives and seeing how they could play it and be so charismatic in that way. And seeing Sidney Prescott again, who once Nev Campbell is just, is the reason why these movies work as far as I'm concerned. Uh, it it really was a super fun time at the movies that I have not haven't really been back to a movie theater very much lately. So I was really pleased with how much this worked for me and the meta aspect. It was so fun. It felt like they were reflecting a lot of things that I've been thinking about when I go to see this current state of movies nowadays and finally seeing a death of these three core characters as well meant a lot to me too. I mean, I'm just kind of listing off. I know we we, we, right we want to so, say yeah. stuff on all these things. Yeah, Peter. So I'm sure. Yeah. So yeah, uh, I will, <laughs> I will just pause there, but it all really, it made me super thrilled and happy. Cool. Like, how I, do you feel about Jenna Ortega? Did, did she, <laughs> well, she appeared going back to in the beginning, uh, right? a film we'd already covered, Tim. Did she really? I like, I love the Tim racking his face, oh my God. <laughs> racking his brain. I face. know she was in, She's in uh, You, the TV show, The you. Babysitter Killer Queen. She's in that? <laughs> she's the girl. Really? She, yeah, she's the love interest. The, like the, the cool, quiet girl who's all punk. And then, oh, man. You know. Wow, you're right. Yeah. I got to uh, watch that now. All right. <laughs> okay. Well, no. To No, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> I watched the first one. I thought it was all right. I no, liked right. it more okay. than Tim. <laughs> she I'm was pretty sure I've listened to that episode. Yeah. Okay. okay. okay well, I want to get it for each of us. Kind of our experience sitting down. When did we click into it? Um, for me, it was when we got to, we were starting to set up the new characters and we meet Sam for the first time. And her boyfriend steps out 
And as soon as you see him, uh, what's that? That actor, Jack Quaid, just your, your mind, my mind just went, oh, he's got to be the killer. You know, yeah, that mine kind of too. thing. <laughs> yeah. And then I realized, wait, no, but scream. So I'm supposed to be thinking that that means, <laughs> no, she is, she's told, I know that'd be, you know, and then I was already off to the races. And then she calls the sister basically within that first, like, couple minutes of that scene i was like okay it's already doing the thing where i'm just thinking all three of these different people talking to each other are have to be the killer so i'm like great i'm in it's doing the scream thing i meet the second they showed richie i was like this is the first man that they've shown in the the film so far he he's a killer i don't know yeah. why that triggers that thought but like immediately that was my instinct to be like all right so this is scream has always been a female centric sort of move like series and just being introduced to that dude <laughs> yeah. was enough for me to be like that's eh, him well so <laughs> okay well what was your experience as far as when did you first plug in you're digging it this is scream again probably the hospital scene the first attack in the hospital scene I sort of was like, here we go. Um, partially because one of my favorite things about the Scream movies is is that interaction of uh, between Ghostface and whoever they're going after. And the dodging and the sort of like just being able to get out of reach and the, the, the battle of that is always my favorite stuff in these movies. Um, and so like, for example, when... Sam is in the whatever that is cafeteria or or whatever uh, room and they're quite literally just dancing around a circular table right and it's just sort of a back and forth like I, you know I used to do that with my brother all the time like rather mm -hmm. he would be chasing me and we'd be like at other odds you know at, at the other ends of the table of each other and like who's gonna go which way first and then she just pushes the table into Ghostface and it like legitimately knocks <laughs> them down and, and she can kind of get away. Like that kind of stuff, like thwarting him or them, the, the ghost faces, is my favorite stuff. So at that point, I was like keyed in. And that's key ghost face characteristics. He has to be just fightable enough to have that tussle. He's not right. a, he or she is. You know, <laughs> but I, I speak as identifying it with that voice and mm -hmm. how ghost face is at the same time, even though there's always the ending of who it actually is. Ghost face is his own thing too. Um, but yes, yes, that's a big part of it. That battle that can play out when they're chasing each other out and that totally, yeah, it, it did a great job of that. Agreed. Yeah. Yeah. I, that is something I've always liked about the, like she, She'll he'll Ghostface will chase Sidney Prescott up the stairs and she'll just be throwing things at his head and it like they will they will hit him. It, like you you see the humanity there. So that kind of makes it a little bit more like scarier and more real. And like yeah, it just feels right. <laughs> well, and that's yeah, that's an interesting component too, because I love that that Ghostface can be slowed down and is and is almost incompetent, almost sort of like out of their element and goofy and yet they still end up killing people well yeah. i realize i think that, yeah. that that back and forth that sort of play is is to me the my most favorite aspect of the scream franchise because i realize what it does is in that moment when that fight is happening it does so much for the suspense of if right. they're gonna get out of it or not because at any given moment they could fight back and succeed like i mean it is truly yeah. we've talked about this many times but the this this tool of reversals right like you want you, the audience, want to be going, oh, yes, they're okay. Oh, no, they're not okay. Oh, sh yes, they got away. No, oh, no, now they're in trouble. And, like, that's what builds excitement and suspense and, you know, all of the things that you want in a good horror film. <laughs> to, and really uh, any film, to be right. honest. Uh, that's the thing about Ghostface is in each of these movies, it's more or less the first time this person has been doing this. It's right. not like you're watching the 12th Halloween movie and it's Michael Myers mm -hmm. once again, master at uh, killing people. So yeah, yeah. The, the Ghostface cannot be too good at killing. Right. Otherwise 
we, I don't know. I'd be like, okay. I, I read my, my favorite example of what I touched on the kill sum, Peter mentioned it already, was the suspense and then moment it happened of the tussle of Wes getting the knife through his neck. Yeah. Was it where it's just like, that's something I've always felt when watching these movies specifically, I guess. I want to say almost all slashers or movies where a knife is the threat is you, you just get that. That's where I feel vulnerable when it, yeah. because there's always that moment where you're trying to push the guy with the girl with the knife away. And it's just that, that pure muscle struggle. You feel it could come towards you slower and slower and slower. And I'm always feeling like, Oh, but what if they get it just there mm-hmm. in that slow approach and to see it play yeah. out? I don't, I can't recall when I've seen that actually happening before mm-hmm. to get it here. So well done. So viscerally with that exact kind of, uh, back and forth lead up that was hands down my favorite just sort of visceral <laughs> kill i mean this. the kills were pretty brutal yeah like yeah, they they were out there <laughs> the uh the moment in the opening scene <laughs> i mean two things happened that really i mean right off the bat i was like oh my god <laughs> we're this is we're at a different level already her putting her hand up mm. to to like yeah. defensively and the just getting her hand stabbed yeah. Yeah. was gnarly and then just getting her leg snapped <laughs> like stomps on the back of her leg and like breaks her I guess shin or whatever it would be is really really <laughs> brutal that was a first yeah that was not something you've seen but in like movies. the sheriff's death is really intensely violent yeah yeah um, repeated stabs yeah. yeah quick repeated stabs mm-hmm. yeah I mean it's I think it's appropriately violent. Um, I didn't think it was gratuitous or over the top, but I was like, yeah, well, this is legitimately violent and scary. Like, they're, whoever is behind the mask is not uh, messing around. Yeah, it's a scream movie. It, I mean, it's... they open Dewey up. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, right, in the front and then in the back as well. Like, just That's really, a uh, lot. I, <laughs> yeah, my face. it was. Uh, yeah. I mean, I just because you mentioned it, that was probably in a non just slasher gore sense, my favorite kill because it, it had to be. He was the one who I uh was most hoping would live, yeah. Do we? Oh, yeah. So when it happened, I was just fully feeling it, and it just it was just sent me for a trip too. When they say then later in the movie, of um, they say something about how big of a deal it would be to to kill off the main the main players or, or the, the stakes are that high that's yeah. what they said and boy did i feel them then and there in that moment so just um you only get so many and the impact that it was supposed to have i definitely felt there was something so well i don't know if this is what worked or what didn't work or what but the fact that the basically what does him in is he gets for a split second distracted because Gail is calling him on his cell phone. I mean, I had that and cell- that definitely was worked for me. It added yeah. this whole other touch of tragedy and just uh, yeah. to it. That was just so, oh, it was brutal. Yeah. It was brutal. And I mean, um, Oh, I mean, you can't help but see the fact that, you know, Courtney Cox and David Arquette, they were actually married in real life. So you, you almost feel that play out in the same way. Mm. Um, <laughs> He yes, he was stabbed in the first movie. He was stabbed in the back, and I think he was. I want to say he was stabbed in the front in the set. He's been, uh, like he so says that he was stabbed eight times. I think he says in this movie. <laughs> right, right. <That's>, uh, <laughs> he's he like, does say that, uh, and, and he's got like some. What do you get? Sh- he got shot too, didn't he? In one of them, so he's got yes. like nerve damage in his leg. Yeah, yeah. Like, he really he gets his limb. Oh, yeah. He really in the, got it bad in the first movie. You think he's dead. That's uh, right. Because yes. he has a, a knife in his back. So yeah, to see that happen on both ends, just it, yeah. it felt very interestingly poetic there as well. Um, so uh, yeah, just experience watching it. I said like, as soon as it was doing the scream thing of um, not knowing, you know, thinking everyone was the killer, I was in it in that sense. But I, I say it got me even earlier than that. What you know, when you talked on the touched on the very first scene, the opening scene with uh, <laughs> Jenna Ortega's character T- Tara Tara. Um, <laughs> she uh the call when she gets the call i thought it was just so interesting and smart what they did with mm. ghost faces voice where at first it doesn't quite 
sound like him. It's just enough to kind of throw us off. But I just there's there's something that was it, it, it as just part of like again like making Ghostface into his own entity. Just the fact that like Ghostface, whoever it is, Ghostface as Ghostface would fake v- sounding like himself sounding like a normal person you know <laughs> right. i thought that was such a cool interesting touch in that sense but then also just to throw us off that little bit of like going like wait is it him it almost sounded like the guy who plays ghost voice is doing a west craven impression which i thought mm. was weird and <laughs> interesting yeah too. yeah no but i felt that way too it was doing a lot of different things that engaged me in a new fresh way it was cool i also oh i have to throw in the fact that it's subverted expectation. Everyone in an opening scene of a scream movie gets killed. So to hear in the mm-hmm. next scene, Oh, she's okay. She survived. That, also <laughs> like, that was something just that like, to hear her that, sh- that after what we just witnessed, yeah. somebody could have survived. Right. That was yeah. pretty shocking. Yeah. That, the way that ghost face was not very thorough. Like I mean, she was just down on the floor, like he completely stabbed, helpless yeah, and ghost face forgot to finish her. Stabbed off. her like 15 times and missed every vital. Organ. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. They <laughs> just make it work with like the timing of hearing the sirens pull up. Yeah. It's like, you can kind of get the timing of, okay, as soon as, we cut to the opening title mm, he yeah. ran out and the ambulance had arrived whatever yeah but <laughs> i i was happy though because i wanted i didn't want that character to die i wanted to see her in more of yeah. the movie and i was glad she yeah did, but see she got more action in that yeah. now mm-hmm. i have to ask at what point did either of you start to suspect amber was the killer it didn't honestly it didn't uh, she was never really a prime suspect as like more so than any of the others um there just because of who she is and who i associate her with um basically the manson family uh, yeah that <laughs> that probably uh had something like, like contributed a little bit but um no there wasn't really a, when watching it the second time there is a moment in the hospital where she and rich are just bantering back and maybe you're the killer. Well, maybe you're the killer. Where were you? Where were you? So that's kind of a good giveaway there. Um, but I never, she was never really tops on my list the way that Rich was. Yeah. Rich was like, I kind of figured that out pretty quickly. Yeah. Maybe this is kind of like what you're saying, but for me, I was just so on my mind. It was just so on my mind of how much I wanted her to be the killer because <laughs> of similarly to you, Peter, being a fan of hers in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood and just I wanted to see her go killer mode so mm. bad um, that that was kind of distracting me from the could it actually be her or not when I was just like, I hope it's her. I hope see, it's I didn't her. make that connection to the Once Upon a Time at all. I f- forgot completely she that she was She gets a horrific real. burning death in both of them. I, it's I, really I know, something. I just forgot that's, that that was the same person because no, I only yeah. saw it the one time when it came out. So That's the thing. I was, cut, like, because I knew what movie I was watching and I saw, oh my God, she's in this movie. I was thinking, wouldn't it be awesome if she, like, got burned to death like in Once Upon a Time <laughs> in Hollywood? Then I found out she was the killer. It's like, what if that's how she died? And it's like, oh, that's that's just crazy. And then the stove turns on, and it it happened. That right. made me so happy. Like, <laughs> there's no way that was unintended. That was I very much believe that that was an intentional. She's gonna have a great uh, acting reel. Just these horrific, incredible deaths. <laughs> yes, largely indeed. getting burned. Hand sanitizer. <laughs> that was that was good. Yeah. Um, the reason I kind of bring that up is because for me, like one of the things that worked quite well in this one is how scene to scene they're they are alluding to or at least making it, you know, suggesting the possibility of anybody being the killer. Right. And they're they're not just saying it, which they do. Right. Like the in conversation of the characters, they kind of say, well, it could be you. It could be you, whatever, for this reason or that. But they are like the film is also showing us things that make us go, well, why'd they show us that? Like, why'd they hold on her a little bit longer? Why'd they hold on him? Like, what was that look? And I think that's kind of the most fun stuff mm-hmm. of these this series as well, that everything is a misdirect anyway. So, like, nothing is. Yeah. In a way. It's like, well, that's like what I was saying. And I love that. That opening scene where it's just, I had to throw my hands up as soon as I was accusing everyone of being the killer. Right, that's right, the exactly. But I will say, the second we see footage of Amber in the opening scene, I was like, that mm. feels off. 
that feels weird. And I started to kind of go, hmm, well, okay, well, maybe it is. Maybe that's who it is. And mm-hmm. and then every scene with her, it feels like it's really leaning toward her. Like she does stuff that you're just like, if you're trying to not be caught as the killer, like you're bad at it. Like right. you're, <laughs> you're constantly doing things and like giving looks or like acting like the jealous girlfriend thing like that. that just a bunch of stuff where I was like, man, she's really laying it on thick. Like, <laughs> but in that sense, that I think makes you the audience kind of immediately go, well, they wouldn't be that heavy handed. So it can't mm. be her. So yeah. maybe that's what they were going for. I don't know. But I like I liked it either way. I liked how it was all framed. Because yeah. everybody does kind of get their little moment, which, you know, I think is apropos to a screen movie. Yeah. Man. Kind of pointed out there's the scene by scene, just sort of paying attention to looks and moments and interactions. But then, like you pointed out, there's also just the more um, the the spoken accusations or the uh, basically what I'm getting. I loved the scene where it's, felt like for the first time in these movies, almost like the scene that you always wanted as soon as you have a, a the first sequel where they're just kind of like, look, it's got to be one of us. So let's just yeah. all sit in a room and talk about it. <laughs> yes. you know? yep. I loved that. And just to have them. Um, and I think where I sat up is as soon as I was, you know, had the thought earlier on of, oh, it could be Sam and she's the killer and just some, you know, it's the main character now that would be new. Uh, so as soon as they brought up that she could be the killer in that scene, that just made me so happy and re-engaged me because then all of a sudden I felt like, okay, the movie's at my level again. <laughs> it, <laughs> it, very, it knows it could be her, which means I don't know if it's her anymore. Did you, after she was attacked in the hospital, did you still think that, that maybe there was a chance that that was just mm-hmm. messing with us that much that she was still no, possibly No, I think at that okay. point, no, no. All right, yeah, yeah. I, uh, I felt the same, but still, I mean... It was quite a shock when Emma Roberts turned out to be the killer in the fourth movie. Right, so I, that's uh, true. Like, don't and then really. I, I don't know. And then I also kind of ruled it out because I thought the plausible explanation was that, you know, something to do with her being crazy. And I thought that was still oh, yeah. too much of a, a sensitive topic to mm. kind of go there that, you know, the person on meds is the killer or whatever. Right. I mean, I guess in things. this case, they they did the opposite, right? They're like her you know her psychosis helped her kill the killer yeah. right <laughs> when she goes crazy on it was like yeah that's that's the da- the, yeah. the daughter of a serial killer right there and, <laughs> and it's yeah used for good it's, it was an awesome moment I thought. um <laughs> the coming back to the house at the end from the original yes you touched on that peter yes so I don't really, I'm not quite sure how I feel. I don't, I'm not sure what your question was, but I'll just go ahead and share. Um, I was just, what, yeah, I mean, if you yeah. had more on it, yeah, please. Well, I, I'm not quite sure how I feel about that because uh, maybe I'm contradicting what I said earlier because I'm remembering now. Yeah, when they first showed the house, I was like, is that Stu's house? And then she goes down into the basement and it's like, uh, there's a shot that directly mirrors the shot of Rose McGowan as she's at the top of the mm-hmm. um, the stairs going down to get the beer. But then she goes down the stairs. The basement doesn't look like the basement in the first movie. It's like, okay, so I guess that's not the house. It just looks like the house. Then then it turns out it is. It's like, was I supposed to not know that was the house the whole time? I, 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 yeah. But you were like, saying it, it worked for you in like the final set piece sense and you liked that it was the come full circle, right? I lo- Yeah, I loved the fact that I was just in that house again. Like just being, uh, just as a fan, as fan service, it really worked well. And uh, in the context of the movie, it made sense too. I, I'm quite certain that wasn't the actual house. The actual house is owned by someone and looks a little bit different now. Like the cut painting is different. So pretty sure that was a set, but uh, that's more of a thing of note. But nonetheless, uh, it was, yeah, it was really cool just the way it mirrored and and the intensity of the way it was shot, the way everything kept building up uh, was just, it, it, it was just mind blowing. It just made me so, so thrilled to be back in that context. Again. Like when she's watching the scene in the very same room. Oh my God. That was amazing. I, like, <laughs> I liked that a lot. I, it's, that is, has been one of the treats of the further sequels is seeing bits of the stab movies that we'll probably right. never get to see the whole thing. But to, like to see more of it this time and see it, it being referenced and, 
I, when I watched Scream 4 uh, a couple of days ago, I had forgotten that there's a reference that in Scream 5, there's like time travel and the fans really hated that. And then they got back to basics with, uh, sorry, Stab 5. It was about time travel. Then they got to back to basics and Stab 6. <laughs> so the idea that now the fans are mad again at Stab 8, but now they're going back to Stab 1 and everyone's happy again. It's just... I would love to see more. Okay. Of these. Well, and also the performances in that stab movie are so terrible. <laughs> they're, they're so bad. I don't know if it's meant to be some kind of commentary there too, but um I mm-hmm. I mean I love the fact that the second Sydney walks into that house, she just shoots every closed door. Yes. Oh, yeah. God. Like I'm I was so excited to see a, you know, a hero moment of her being like, "Yeah, I'm not gonna fall for any of this bullshit yeah. which i love that stuff <laughs> yeah you have five seconds to show yourself killer or not like she yeah. didn't i was like yeah because <laughs> why why wouldn't an innocent person just right come out at that point and, and then, she does shoot him yeah yeah which she, damn <laughs> a lot of people get shot and still work out pretty much okay after yeah, we'll, life, but, we'll, we'll talk about yeah, okay, that sure, later yeah, peter we'll there, right? okay. <laughs> um, but yeah she shoots him and uh he still manages to play it off and i still she, I should have 100% figured it out at that point, but still, still was only like 80% sure yeah. it was rich. <laughs> yeah. I kind of, I wanted to bring up that again, just I thought it was another example of, okay, I, I guess I, so I thought this was an interesting theme that the film was playing with is the idea that with these requills, and this is where I thought this was working in the meta commentary sense of common, you know, <laughs> putting into the, the the bones of the movie itself uh, what requels do and doing it itself, mm-hmm. you know? So there's always the idea that, like, with fans and the, the nostalgia, there's this part of us that always, like, wants to go back to the original thing, but we can't, you know? And that's mm-hmm. what I think requels are always wrestling with in an interesting way. And this film, I think, is in conversation with that in a really interesting way. Whereas like whether it's, you know, the house in the end and just the way that when we're in it and when she's in that room, that same living room, it just like, it's seeing the new TV there versus the old TV where, you know, it's just different. Mm -hmm. It's the, uh, the built in effect of just having the main players just look older, you know, it's, um, but then it's intentional in, in bits and pieces. Like, it, it, I don't know, I started thinking about this in the moment where the, 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 the weird sketchy ex-boyfriend or whatever guy is that earlier death mm-hmm. with red right hand playing yes. in the car radio. Uh, I can't where really forget about that. It yeah. just, the movie that you're watching and adjusted to at that point, at this point, it just felt so separate from the originals and hearing the song from the original in it just kind of called that out in a way. And it's like saying we can't even use it in the soundtrack anymore unless it's um, diegetic and within, you know, the, <laughs> right, the world right. of the movie itself. It's sort of almost going like that was then we can't go back to like that fitting anymore. We're so far from there, which is kind of tied back to what I was saying about it kind of working in its favor of not being a Wes Craven movie in that sense of like, you can't go back and it's almost better that we have uh, jumped ahead now, <laughs> you know, to, to modern times fully. So and that, that was just something I was paying attention to. It was anything that was playing with that. I thought it was really cool. I, I do want to say about the whole meta aspect of this movie, um, which on one hand you can, I've, I've read, I try not to be too influenced here, but I have read a, re, a couple of reviews saying like, why is this movie so meta? Like just get to the point, just get to the scares. And I just have to come back. The scream movies have always been that for, right. the first movie was that it was commenting on the state of slasher movies at that time. Scream two was commenting on the state of sequels. I don't, I don't need to go down the list and here we are. Scream 2022 is commenting on the state of the film industry right now and saying that it's not just horror movies that are doing this. In fact, it's probably less horror than most other genres actually right now. But and they're, you know, you have something like Blair Witch 2016, which I'm not sure if you guys have seen. I do not recommend it. It was so bad. Yeah, it's like there was 
that when it goes back to the house at the end, it was just so lame. And just remaking the like movie with different characters and all this new technology. It's like they were they had no business doing what they did with Blair Witch compared to <laughs> it was like, Scream cool. is what it is. It's this the theme of it. Setting so. it up with the new technology and that well, we don't want to just talk about yeah, Blair Witch. No, but no, I think I mean <laughs> maybe a I don't know, example where you're saying or a way to like pinpoint what Scream is doing specifically. It's like yeah, Scream's the only one that will talk about it out loud, mm. but all of their horror movies should be in, <laughs> I've said this right. a lot, should be in conversation with the state of horror films, but just in the sort of knowing where audiences are at, knowing where right. expectations are at. It's like um, how in Scream, which the Scream movies do too, though, on top right. of just saying it out loud, but the saying out loud is the unique thing. But like in, it happens uh, like in in the Actually, like, you know how it plays out. Like, I thought that was so smart with Scream 4 as an example. It was very of the time to have, we talked about this, to have the final set piece uh, be one that, like, the the twist one. Like, the movie has this extra sort of almost yeah. fourth act set piece, final, final set piece to it, just to kind of make it bigger and surprise <laughs> us. Like, to have that built into it. Yeah. Anyway. And commenting on it as well. It's like when uh, they're like the killer or Emma Roberts, like the movie is supposed to be over. Why <laughs> yeah. is this st- really? It's still going on. See, it's that's like, oh. the thing that screams does. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and they, and it does it well. Like, that's, that's why I love them. Cause it, that's it. I can appreciate the scream movies, not necessarily as a horror fan, just as a fan of filmmaking and as a fan of like just culture in general, like it all, it, it works on so many levels. Yeah. I feel like the fact that you Uh-oh. found <laughs> the fact that you found a review that <laughs> that like manages to not just miss the point <laughs> but also like be exactly what the movie is commenting on yeah. at the same time is pretty remarkable <laughs> and this was a critic who i generally i won't call him out but someone who i generally respect i follow his review i was surprised to see him go that's, the direction he did in this oh review man that's a, annoying yeah <laughs> maybe he just doesn't like horror i don't know yeah. who knows <laughs> I, I honestly most reviewers and critics that i hear in not i mean obviously specific horror critics like horror but most of your general world critics seem to really dislike horror i yeah. never hear good reviews for horror from like your typical whoever like the npr people or whatever yeah. um which is whatever it's been an inherent bias for yeah, yeah. pretty uh well pretty that's long. uh uh they, they just like elevated horror quote yeah quote. right the baba duke i'm sure did fine yeah, right? probably yeah. <laughs> Uh, that was some, uh, I mean, no, I don't have anything to say on that. I was just looking <laughs> at the, the terms, uh, they brought up elevated horror, mm-hmm. um, which I, it was cool. I guess that, that, that worked, but I don't know what else it did with it, but I think just being just again, self-awareness yeah. of the world of horror around you in this era is all you need. Yeah. Like I, that's there's a the, what's the term hanging a lantern right like this do you know this term mm, it no, seems like an so. old term to me hanging lantern <laughs> back is just, when they had lanterns <laughs> yeah no, no 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 but it's just a term to to say that like when there it when there is a conceit in a in a film or or a play or whatever you write a character in to call it out and there that's the act of hanging a lantern they're shining a light on the fact that yes we know that this is a conceit or that mm. this is kind of a dumb thing so just have a character in there to call it out i mean that's what randy's character is in the first movie but but the beauty of the way wes craven and and um what's his name kevin, kevin williamson. williamson build that is that they're they're expanding on that trope of like okay yeah we're not just gonna like say have have a character that hangs a lantern and then move on we're gonna make them integral to the story and i think that carrying that through is always really exciting that's what again another thing that makes a screen movie a screen movie yeah well did you have any other things that worked either of you speak now forever hold your peace um the the implementation of all the new technology with cell phones we went back i mean we started with landlines before caller id was even really a thing um <laughs> and now they have uh when 
the killer basically tricks um whatever is net cuba gooding jr's son um into uh sharing his location oh, so right. that you know, yeah and yeah like that was like using that you know, you'd think cell phones would kill movies like this but no they have found ways to make them just to utilize them in just that clever of a way and the fact that his hands are too bloody to be able to yeah, push I like that. The butt, that was <laughs> that so was like that was cool i i wouldn't have thought to do that that was yeah so things like that like bringing in the new technology that really worked for me as well so. yeah i don't think i have anything else overt Next section, what did not work? It's not ready yet. Seems to work okay. No, something important's missing. What did not work? (laughs) (laughs) Anyone? I mean, I almost just wanted to clarify again since it's uh, maybe been a minute, Tim, and uh, we have new listeners here. Uh, This is all in the spirit of friends getting together our (laughs) own very own subjective opinions it kills me inside every time to speak bad about anything or anyone that pulls off the miracle that is making a film uh that being said (laughs) we have our own experience watching it and we hope it can be taken in the spirit of if there is anything to our feelings that the collective filmmaking uh world can benefit from it are you worried about toxic fans on twitter right now <laughs> um, no right. just my own going we don't want circles. to be the toxic fan <laughs> yeah, i think okay. is what <laughs> yeah, yeah. we're getting at yeah okay. yeah no and i mean yeah i don't know for tim and i you know we always come at this from a view of uh filmmakers breaking it down yeah and it feels weird to say that to who you know to sometimes be critiquing as i see it as people who are brothers and sisters in arms doing what uh we should be so lucky to get to do too yeah Yeah, i kind of look at it though like a lot of how i frame it is like if i were if it were me making this what would i have done differently or what would i've tried to to accomplish um and like a big one for me in this that stuck out is like i left the movie kind of going who is the main character like who like i know it's sam like i know it is but I didn't feel like Sam was the main character. And I think there's something there that like if that's happening, that's something to be like concerned about, <laughs> you know, like you shouldn't feel disconnected from the main character. And I totally did. I'm not sure why or what could have changed to to make that not the case, but it felt really fractured to me from a protagonist point of view. Um, And I didn't feel like I cared that much about her in the same way that I've always felt very concerned with the well-being of Sidney Prescott. And so I don't know what to attribute that exactly to. I can't quite pinpoint it, but I don't know. It felt disappointing almost to me that 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 was what I I, I walked out with. I wasn't really rooting for her. I was like, all right. I I do have I I do somewhat agree with that. Well, I, yeah, you know what? I do agree with that. I think a big problem with the character is. And I, 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 I'm an, same, same with what you guys are saying. I'm an actor. I feel bad sometimes when I have to talk bad about other actors, but I think Melissa Barrera kind of drops the ball, particularly with her two bedside conversations with her sister. It's play. She plays it. I feel way too heavy and soap opera ish in a way Mm. that doesn't feel it's it's just over the top. It doesn't feel like a way a sister would actually talk to another sister. It It's just too much. And I felt I was definitely laughing at those scenes. And I don't think those were moments where the filmmakers wanted me to be laughing. You can never really be 100% sure with a Scream movie, but <laughs> right. I don't think I was supposed to be laughing. It's funny. I totally agree that that moment felt off. Yeah. And I remember kind of thinking to myself what are we doing? Like, what Like what are we doing right now in the movie? It's exposition. It's 
trying to connect us to this emotional thing. But like, I don't care. You know what I mean? Like, I'm like, I don't care how bon- it's it was a little bit too much sort of just telling us that this is really sad and not like we could have felt that through a different a totally different like device uh i don't know it it felt forced i think is actually what i walked away with where it's just like oh okay we got to get this exposition mm-hmm. out let's like let's like really cut deep and have them have this emotional moment together and like the audience will feel that and i didn't feel that i felt kind of like okay here's an actor really really working hard to try and like dig deep down into this like emotional moment but it when you're trying to be emotional <laughs> as an actor that tends to come off disingenuous when you try not to be emotional as an actor and it leaks out we go oh shit because that's what humans do we don't yeah. we don't try to cry and have like our our cry face like look okay yeah we try not to cry and know that our cry face is really ugly. We're trying not to show that. And so that something about that whole scene just kind of didn't feel like it fit into the movie. It didn't really land in the way that I think they wanted it to. And so ultimately it just left me going, okay, well, they failed now at me caring about this character. Mm. Which sucks because you want to. I mean, I want to. I want to root for whoever's, you know, we're set up to root for. It was it was too soon for two people who we essentially just met. Right, it right. was uh, it was acting as if this was the fifth entry in a franchise that we have yeah. followed these people from the beginning. I could almost. see that yeah. scene working at the end of the second act. Yeah, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know, like like let's say let's say their mom who I, I love that they're kind of their parents just are off. You know, like yeah. the dad obviously left. That's fine. I get that. But their mom, they mention, I think, one time, like, where's mom? Oh, she's in London. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> it's like, what if she, like, if she had come back and been a victim of the killers toward the sort of end of the second act, and then they have to, like, the 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 family secrets have to be aired through that, I could kind <laughs> of get on board with this type of scene. I don't think that's appropriate for this movie, but, like, if I were to structure the emotional ex like the family secret scene in a movie i wouldn't put it at the turn into the second act i put it into the turn into the third act yeah. it just doesn't seem i don't know it's yeah. felt out of place it uh yeah i i agree and i mean melissa barrera she well she's no nev nev campbell one of the keys to her performance is how well she was able to underplay um i mean yeah she talks a lot about her family history uh Basically, yeah, it leading into the third act in the first Scream movie. And she's like barely even looking at the person she's talking to, which, you know, is her boyfriend, Billy. But yeah, another. But she's like, <laughs> she's just kind of like talking to herself and just going through that. She And yeah, the for to have this intense, dramatic moment with this sister who she doesn't apparently doesn't really know that well. We don't really know. They've been estranged. So. If yeah, if her goal is to keep her sister from getting angry with her, you don't start crying and pleading with you her right off the bat to forgive her. Like you, you just yeah, you lay out the stakes as as you mentioned. You, yeah. yeah, I mean, from a just an overarching character construction, there's it. It felt just a little too. What's a good word for this? It felt a little too easy. So like. If we're going to like a character, there's lots of ways to to set a character up for us to like them. But they don't have to be likable, right? Like they can be jerks. Mm-hmm. And she, you know, for all intents and purposes, if we're seeing the the Sam character through Tara's eyes, which we, we've, like Tara's the first person we met, we're kind of automatically going to. And she's the one saying like, you left me. Sam should not, you know, like the hero's journey kind of stuff. She should not answer the call, right? The call comes in and says, your sister just got attacked. She should 
kind of be a jerk about it. Don't like I I feel mm. like her being like I'll be right there completely just you know extinguishes any conflict that you could have like the whole point of this this deep family secret thing is rooted in the conflict between these two people and they just kind of extinguish it right off the bat. Oh, I'm here for you. Yeah. Well, but you weren't you weren't there for me. Well, I'm here now. So, what's <laughs> like what's the big deal? Like it 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 just deflates the the impact of their relationship uh, in this moment. And so I just think sometimes writers well, I know that this is true. I think a lot of us are afraid to make our protagonists our protagonists <laughs> <laughs> our protagonists messy and potentially unlikable in moments. And I tend to think the opposite is more effective a lot of the time, not always. But for me, it's more effective to see a protagonist that is messy and is flawed and is maybe really struggling. I think that's kind of why Dewey works, right? Mm-hmm. Like Dewey is a mess. <laughs> and and granted, we have the luxury of knowing him and knowing the character and context and everything. But like – he does exactly what I'm talking about. Kids show up. They say, hey, we need your help. And he's like, go away. Yeah. No, absolutely yeah. not. I'm not doing it. And then he has to sit down with himself and go, god damn it. I'm Dewey. <laughs> like, this is what I Dewey. <laughs> uh-huh. uh, right. right. I'm going to go put myself to killer. <laughs> Right. Like, that's pretty standard good construction of like character you know progress and motivation don't answer the call and then have a moment to yourself and realize like you are who you are you have to step up to that do we answer the call ghostbusters answer the call (laughs) but we don't get that with sam at all like we don't get that even in the slightest bit we get like kind of through Richie, this proxy version of that, but we obviously that's all a manipulation anyway. I wonder if they ran into like, okay, we have the the we're we're gonna do the thing where now the girl who's attacked in the opening scene actually survives and she's gonna be the main character. And then they go, oh wait, but then she would just be the main character in the hospital, the whole film, the whole film. So we can't really do that. Yeah. <laughs> and then, so what if she has a sister? And I don't know. Oh, yeah, that's maybe, interesting. Maybe, yeah. yeah. Hard to know. Um, but that, to me, by far was the biggest issue that I walked out going like, oh, shit, I never really felt connected to the person that I think we're supposed to. And then I think that that actually has a domino effect because when Sydney and Gail show up, I'm like, just leave, guys. Like, <laughs> don't get involved. <laughs> It's like, <laughs> like I don't, right I don't care about this person. So like, just let her, whatever. Right. Yeah. We want to be wrapped up with the new characters just as much as the originals. Like we were with the originals at the time. Yeah. I kind of agree. Uh, I guess for all similar reasons, I didn't get quite caught up in her as our, our new hero. Like so you I think she was an to. underwritten proxy or who may not have actually existed in an earlier draft possibly so, i mean the main i don't character know that's just here. one i mean i i, <laughs> I kind of like right? <laughs> yeah i mean i it, what you said earlier yeah it certainly in modern filmmaking yeah it, if writers are or maybe it's because they're forced on this this is forced on them i think um, you're i think that's probably very true right a lot of the time people are so afraid to make protagonists or any character at all unlikable is there will be like a new BuzzFeed article, 10 reasons why this character was actually the worst when you thought she was the best. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. that's like, it's, oh my God, everything has to be so squeaky clean nowadays. And yeah, so they, uh, yeah. yeah, but we're not right. Like mm-hmm. humans are just the worst and like <laughs> yeah. messy. Like, don't you, like, don't we want to see that? Right. Like you feel that in the original, what Nev Campbell's like Sydney's going through where, you I don't know you just get that weight of her history of what happened to her mom a year ago like it's in her interactions with you know whether it's uh uh Gail you know confronting her and uh uh you know when she deserves that punch and you know the way (laughs) the way that's played or when 
Stu is just, uh, or not, not Stu, Billy is just, you know, like, hey, get over it. Your mom died, <laughs> you know, and it's just, she's, God, we feel, but I never can say I felt the same way with yeah. her and their history. You're right. There, there's, it is, it is lazy writing to just have a long conversation like that. When you look at the way we find out about Sydney's history is that pretty masterful sequence where it's barely alluded to when she's in school. Then she comes home and sees the news, uh, the news report from Gail uh, talking about what happened. And then you see the photo on the um, on the mantle. So you find out who her mom is and you all just you just put it back, put it together without her saying a word. It's um, yeah, it's different. (laughs) So I think it's really important from a storytelling point of view that like when you have big reveals of like history, so discovery for any character it's always best not always possible but always best for that character to discover it themselves rather than having somebody tell them the thing that they've been waiting to hear Mm, right like and so you can do that in lots of different ways but like just for a very simple example would be why'd you leave it's been five years and Sam can't answer it. That's crushing, right? And having to see these two people not be able to communicate the secret and like reveal the truth and have a discovery forces Tara to need to know more, need to find out what that is. And then you can set up ways for that to happen. But just telling it doesn't work. Um I think I should stop talking about this one thing that bothers me about this movie. <laughs> so that's it. I'm going to lay that to rest. All right. Um, thing I had top of the list here. I mean, it's, this is where I like, I wish I could better remember my experience watching the first screams to see if I'm being unfair here. But uh, I never, aside from never knowing, you, you know, never being confident who the killer was, um, and I love that moment again, where it like acknowledged how Sam could be the killer that felt like the movie, uh, you know, is on my level. But aside from that, I can't say like the movie, those things didn't feel like the movie was in that one step ahead of me, like way that I wanted it to be at like all times, like whether it was this kind of, I, I don't know, maybe it's my brain's just always going everywhere. But during that opening sequence, I was just, and, and, you know, I wanted that impact of, oh God, she just died. I'm like, I bet she lived because that would be subverting expectations. And then I don't (laughs) know. I was just like, okay. And then here we are. Or then just kind of in like the sense of um, the scene when Wes gets killed off and we kind of have that, (laughs) it's that ongoing gag of like the music's playing up, Mm -hmm. like when he moves the cupboard door or whatever and uh, Ghostface is going to be there. Like, yeah, that's fun. Um, but of course, the, the the time it does happen is the exact time that I was expecting it then. And I wasn't expecting it and each of those fake out times. So it wasn't exactly like funny. I don't know. I don't know. It just, just wasn't. I don't know. I wanted to actually I thought that was a cool moment to then actually surprise me the moment, you know, ghost face jumps out just didn't happen. Um, and then also, you know, I said how great it was and impactful it was Dewey's death sequence but that just felt like i also just kind of saw it happening before it actually played out where i was like okay i bet you know the elevator doors gonna open and um he's you know then the the the, how does it play yeah but then they're gonna shoot the killer right then and there you know i don't know i just saw that happening i have (laughs) a problem with that that sequence and then sorry and then even also just like when he goes back to That's, do that final yeah. kill it's like oh yeah. so this is where dewey's probably gonna die right yeah. now i that really kind of annoyed me actually i really think that you can play that sequence out just slightly differently and not have it feel trite because it ends up being too much of this like oh i had to, i just shot him like he like dewey has shot the killer like five times in the chest and then they just kind of casually walk 
away yeah. to the elevator and he goes, wait, they always come back. Let me go back. That felt so stupid to me. Well, he can do that, but then that the movie has to have that thought too and then be like, he either has to have the second thought and there's like, no, F that I'm not actually going to do that. Then the killer jumps up behind, whatever, or the rather, you know, the... Um, Sam stays behind and is like, no, then I'm going to help you too to make sure nothing happens. Something. I don't know. Right. I mean, you, there's a bunch of ways you could do it. I thought to myself, okay, don't have them walk away. Mm-hmm. Right? Have Dewey shoot, shoot the killer and immediately go to take the mask off and come up with a reason why they can't do it in that moment. Why they have to get out of there. Mm-hmm. Whatever that... It could be so many different things. I mean, Tara's in rough shape right then anyway so like have it be something where it's like he wants to and he almost can take the mask off right there but he doesn't and they get you know they carry on so i can justify them not pulling the mask off right away now the going back part i don't know man like don't go back or like have him try to shoot Ghostface in the head right away like after he's you know, put him down with the five shots initially, have him trying to try to shoot him in the head and be out of bullets. I don't know. Like my, yeah. something, my ex- something, <laughs> my expectations would have been really subverted actually, if they had pulled the mask off in there and we get for the first time a killer reveal halfway through. And then uh, the ones, yeah. the second or third ones saved till the end, you know, I was, um, Considering how many times Dewey has made that mistake throughout the series <laughs> of not shooting the killer in the head, I was really surprised that he did that. I mean, but then, but yeah, but then he remembers to go back. It's like, okay, finally, maybe he's he's kind of learned his lesson. It was a, a decade since the last like, one, you know. What's that? It was a decade since the last one. Yeah, he's, right. <laughs> I mean, in the the end of the third movie they're like, shooting the guy in the chest over and over again it's like, head head dewey head like why <laughs> why does he still forget to shoot him in the head and it's yeah just lo- unloading that off but i did kind of like i still couldn't help but uh just my reverence for these characters and how much i love the uh, you know how, how many times i've watched them i couldn't help but appreciate the hero aspect of it. it's like no, you guys go away. I'm going to take care of this myself. Like, like it, leading them away and not letting them come come with it. I, I kind of liked that about it. It but. almost did kind of play like in a works in a self-aware way, I guess, that he is stepping off into his death. Like the mm-hmm. elevator door closes and he's right. stepping. I don't know, but yeah. I was expecting the killer to be gone when he came back. I was actually really surprised mm. the killer was still there. Yeah. But because uh, yeah, they always frequently after they get shot, they disappear. <laughs> but, right, right. Um but I I will say the um the closing of the doors in that that you mentioned earlier like and Wes, yeah, when he when he's closing the doors and the killer's not there. I feel kind of like I was right on the page with them cuz I I also at the same time knew the killer probably wasn't going to be there. I felt like that was the movie saying, here's a stupid thing that horror movies do all the time. And we're not going to like, and you know that we know that maybe I'm giving it too much credit there, but it, that didn't bother me. That worked for me there. So yeah, I was okay with worked. that too. Yeah. I thought yeah. it was, you know, it was a joke. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was fun, but just something about like, it wasn't use that to then make the actual kill be a surprise, which True, I guess it wasn't. Right. Yeah. They didn't go the one, yeah, that one step <laughs> further like into it opening of scream four <laughs> right right <laughs> oh man anything else <laughs> with you guys i mentioned all the characters and performances that i liked but <laughs> i felt like wes was kind of a nothing character for me i wish there could have been more to him uh i don't even remember her name um the long haired, what the long haired one? I don't remember her name. What oh, Liv? Geez. Liv? Yeah, it's probably the, Liv. The girlfriend of one of the twins. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Liv. She. Right. Right. Yeah. Liv. She felt like kind of a nothing character compared to the other casts, even the lesser sequels. They were all those characters were so memorable. I really felt it when they would get killed, even in the first one with. Like Henry Winkler, we only meet him like one time before he gets killed, but they do establish him enough that mm-hmm. we are genuinely sad when that happens. Whereas Wes, it just it yeah the the killing is done really gruesomely and creatively, but I 
he felt so inconsequential from the beginning that it didn't surprise me. He was one of the first ones. It was to funny. Go off. I uh, cared about him because I liked his mom, Judy. Uh, yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. That was, that's where I got Boy, suspense Mar- from. Marley Shelton from 2000 to 2011 to 2022. Those are the only times I've seen that actress. It's nice that she's been back. Mm-hmm. I, she did a lot in the early 2000s and then just these screen movies is all I've seen her in since. But yeah. Uh, yeah, I, that, but then, yeah, Liv, she just didn't make much of an impact uh, compared to the other cast where it everyone had their own personality, their own quirks, and were really memorable. When the cast list, you know, you see the title cards or the cards next to the actors, like, I was like, oh, right, that person was in this movie. Oh, that person was in this movie. They were complete, they had completely left my mind because of the super memorable climactic sequence for me. So. Yeah, it is an interesting thing. I think part of why that, occurred is that in this movie you have you're basically doubling the cast that's true yeah. right and so those few characters live Wes um Kyle Gallner <laughs> um, yeah they f- they fall into caricature and sort of just you know live just becomes this kind of she's the I mean, I can't even describe her. She's such a two-dimensional character. Yeah. Right? Like, she's the girlfriend who had an ex-boyfriend who was a jerk. <laughs> that's so. That's such a non-character. That's, right. that's a caricature at best. And Wes is... I mean, they tried to kind of set him up that he has a thing for Tara. But... We never see that. Mm-hmm. We don't see any interaction between the two of them that suggests that that is is based in something that we care about. And we get a glimpse of him being annoyed that his mom is the sheriff. <laughs> That's it. So, like, again, there's this problem, I think, with not wanting to write characters to be kind of messy. Like, like... Why not have the scene before Judy dies be Wes and Judy having like kind of a gnarly mother son fight? Yeah. yeah. So that we like it's too nice. Everything's a little too like smooth. That's a uh, I don't know. I noticed I feel like that is a recurring problem with these uh requels in a lot of ways. Like yeah, Star Wars, the original Star Wars are like fantasy adventure movies for kids, but something about them even just felt more like adult or like not coddling in a certain way. I don't know. Yeah. So, you know, so be it, I guess. Yeah. But it, it does, it it feels like it dilutes the movie. It just makes it, makes it feel a little watered down. Yeah. that That is one of the, I think one of the, problems of course with the the bedside sequence as well it's you have to make a two-hour movie you're introducing all these new characters bring in the old characters maybe there's just not any more time to establish it except for that so like that was the only right. way you can do it to fit it in the but time it frame feels like it takes longer than if it was just sort of <laughs> you're probably right. you're that probably, scene yeah. felt like an eternity to yeah. me <laughs> so you know yeah. uh but uh but it ended eventually and i got back to the characters that i appreciated <laughs> right. so yeah. all right well i had a couple more things i guess the bigger one was uh for me there was no real memorable set pieces really which the first one to run through it the first one every set piece is a memorable set piece because it's all classic you know it's like (laughs) going in the different houses it's all the final house it's great it's great um second one unlike you peter i think the college setting is great that 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 (laughs) final play and having that was like where sydney's trying to you know is you know there's people coming at her and it's bringing up her trauma like all that was super cool getting to see randy all of a sudden in a a setting with fellow film geeks in film school like it's so much fun yeah i could go on that scream three like you pointed out the set of the house you know that whole thing was great even the kind of sleuthing through hollywood old big hollywood mansion hollywood hills house like can think of all that memory you know is memorable um scream four yeah it's just a lot yeah i don't know there were some nice classroom scenes to it that we hadn't really had before too too much but mostly it was just the uh the party that i love a uh, a uh, stabathon like that is <laughs> such a fun i don't know that was a fun yeah and then 
maybe it was just because that hospital was a surprise one uh, and a set piece that always felt memorable to me. Um, and yeah, it's just a lot of in houses too in Scream Four, but uh, the way it plays out with Jill beating herself up, I don't know. It makes it <laughs> memorable in a way. Um, but this one, it just kind of felt like, yeah, we're just kind of okay. We're in we're in the hospital. We're we're. Uh, we're, we're in this house, we're in that house, we're in this house. And then the ending, what should be like a, oh my God, come full circle thing, which I was experiencing partly like you, yeah, I was like, oh, so cool. It's the final one. Or it's the, the, the house from the original is where the final finale is taking place. It like, it, it felt like when that revelation happened, it never, it did a good job hiding it at first. Like, I don't know, like, it's cool. You kind of sniffed it. D- didn't really. Di- yeah, for me, didn't do a good job. But yeah, go ahead, continue. Um, yeah. yeah, for me, I just was not expecting yeah. it. Yeah. But then the reveal of it, it felt like it didn't revel in that reveal or, or like at all. It just sort of felt there were no kind of like mirroring shots or any kind of like, I don't know, like kind of comparing how it would be. I was I found myself like only from that point on, I was like, OK, I'm trying to like picture it how it was in the original like I don't know it it didn't it didn't take it fully take advantage of that for me and I don't know if it was just a, a a beats getting played out or or just how it was then once that revelation happened yeah it just didn't I don't know visually do anything with it after that for me to make it feel like the ending set piece it just the whole thing kind of felt to me like they didn't have the original house which is <laughs> I don't know it is just like a set that they were just kind of working around and shooting around which works when they're trying to hide it, but not once the twist happens. That, um, yeah, by the way, that's just speculation on my mind. I don't know that for a fact that it wasn't actually the original. I know, house, I'm wondering it, yeah, too. Yeah. I'm like, since they Airbnb'd it out last Halloween, you'd think right. they'd be okay with letting people film. Yeah. But maybe not. <laughs> Filming's a bigger ordeal. Yeah, if, if it was the original house, I agree. They were probably not utilizing it as well as they could have. But... There were, uh, well, I mean, yeah, not necessarily to, to, I I get, I get what you're saying, but I also thought like when he's like standing over uh, Sam or, and, and Sydney and like that, that shot kind of mirrored when Billy is standing over Sydney in that. And that they even repeat a a little bit of the dialogue and the comment on that as well. Something about it. I feel like it felt rushed to me. I don't know. Mm -hmm. And I think that end shot, there was a. A photo, uh, some photos behind the scenes that they, uh, one of the actors posted on Twitter, and they're all standing like in front of a green screen at the end. Oh. I feel like that. I don't know. My guess for that would be that end last shot, which like it it was really cool and worked. But I, I think it was like not the original location. You know, it was they they green screened in that sort of gorgeous view that the mm. <laughs> that house has <laughs> behind them. Oh uh, yeah, um, I, that's probably true. <laughs> I don't know. I was just so excited when it was the original house and then it felt like it didn't like play with that. Yeah. I I think maybe just the idea of it being the original house was enough for me. Like just being uh, transported back to that situation and that setting like that, that worked well enough. And just the creative things that they found, well, to in my mind, the creative things that they found to do with it that weren't necessarily exactly the way it played out the first time. Although the closet stuff that did remind me a lot of like, you know, uh, Sydney coming out of the closet with the umbrella and stabbing um, uh, Billy in the chest during that, that reminded yeah. me of that. Um, <laughs> no, there was stuff. Some, yeah. Yeah. So I mean, it, but I honestly, I was so locked in or and clicked in at that point when the killers were revealed and you got uh the Joel McHale looking um, <laughs> Jack Quaid. He looked so much like Joel McHale to me. I don't know about you guys, but um, uh, the, his expressions and everything. Boy, t- if this movie were made 10 years ago, I'm pretty sure Joel McHale would have played that role. Um, and uh, so, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, you that's that didn't work for you. I respect that. That's okay. <laughs> but again, this was first time viewing. I'm just, who knows? I don't know, man. <laughs> well, I have one more. And... I don't understand it. Okay. I don't understand why you why you do this oh. as as a director or a writer or whatever. All three of the heroines in the finale get a wound in the exact same spot. <laughs> <laughs> all right. What are we doing? <laughs> Mix it up a little. <laughs> yeah, why is it all in the left like abdomen? I don't know, Tim. Why? There's think, no good reason for that. 
maybe like visually the way they film it, that's the easiest area of the body to hide. So when they're continuing to run around as if they haven't been wounded, the audience doesn't notice. <laughs> or but dude, I'm oh. I'm sorry, but like that's a that's a bad wound. Like Gail yeah. gets shot there. I was gonna say maybe it's shot something that you, with a gun. you can just survive <laughs> it, or it's like most likely you to miss can. a vital organ. But you could survive, you know, like you could get shot through the shoulder, you could get shot in the leg, you yeah. could get stabbed in a bunch of different places and kind of be, you can like willing suspension of disbelief that you survive that. I mean, for fuck's sake, Tara gets stabbed like 50 times in the opening <laughs> scene and she survives. So like, like the world's our oyster here, like stab them wherever we want, mm-hmm. stab them in the face for all we care, like like do something to, why is it the same spot <laughs> I don't that's know, so yeah. stupid to me like yeah. it, 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 it by the third person i was like I, i'm starting to get mad like i'm actually like feel like i'm being messed with here like this is stupid so that pissed me off i don't know what else to say it just seems what like what why come on yeah, yeah. Uh, can't argue with that. Yeah, that's right. I won't dwell uh, on it. But the last little thing I had was uh, I wanted more connection to scream for because because I'm such a fan. <laughs> I, they brought back Marley. I Shelton. was going to say yeah. they, they brought back Judy, but I don't know. Uh, and then when I'm thinking about, it, I'm like, wait, did anyone actually survive? They could have brought back <laughs> like apparently. Um, oh yeah, this is things of note. But apparently, Kirby like you know we're always wondering. Oh, you know, d- did she actually survive? We didn't see her die at the end of Scream Four. That uh, in the the Dead Meat James clip where they're reviewing the stab movies that are on screen, there's like something about, um, I guess, the Kirby in the stab movies surviving or something like that. Um, Wait, Kirby? I'm sorry. Who who is who is Hayden Panettiere? Oh, her. Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you don't really see her actually die. Yeah, so a lot of people right. are hoping she'd come back. Anyway, just such a Scream 4 <laughs> fan. I don't know, just wanted more connection to that. But again, I don't even know if it was possible or if everyone was killed, I forget. But anyway. Uh, I did like this. I mean, this probably doesn't satiate your appetite for Scream 4 stuff, but I did. Like, I watched Scream, then the next night <laughs> I watched Scream 4, then the next night I watched Scream again. So. Sorry, 2022, Scream 4, 2022. So yeah, in between oh. those two viewings, I watched Scream 4. So I caught in my second viewing, Lemon Squares in the refrigerator. Yep. Lemon Squares, she was all about like the Lemon that. Squares in Scream 4. I like 4, that. So. Great. <laughs> um, so there was that. But uh, <laughs> I mean, they two- even say, like, uh, <laughs> when Wes says, uh, I'm related to, to what? Uh, to, Judy? To... to she, her his her son says wait what am i in danger and he says nobody cares about the inferior sequels wes like, <laughs> right, like, right. So, <laughs> well um, again that's all just i love yeah. judy so i was i was happy for her yeah judy, coming back yeah. anyway yeah man, i'm glad she i'm glad she came back too yeah marley shelton is she's fun uh cool yeah <laughs> that's it for what did not work then yeah then we can I move suppose. on Oh, what did you think about the Billy flashbacks? I, I don't know. I, I'm not sure how I felt about that. If that was I, really worth bringing the actor back to do that. I did respected it? that they were doing something that felt new to the franchise that someone could hallucinate in that kind of way. Yeah. So I just thought it was a cool new thing that they were trying. And I just got a kick out of seeing him. And I was like, sure, great, fun. <laughs> I'm still on the fence of how I feel about that. So I, yeah, I thought it was... Okay. All right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Fair enough. I thought there was something kind of fun going on, maybe more in that effect I'm talking about of like how we're so far separated now. To see see him with that same haircut, just like in this world, just I don't know. It was just kind of a trip in a fun way. Yeah. And still dressed the same way yeah. as the climax. <laughs> No oh, good. Yeah, I think I'm, I'm, everything else worked perfectly for me right there. <laughs> Great. <laughs> All right, then. Well, let's see if we had any non what worked or didn't work things of note. Things of note. <laughs> this should be interesting. Question for you guys mm-hmm. Does calling out elevated horror? make this film elevated <laughs> and are the scream movies <laughs> elevated horror uh, can we just say for me that they term, are. it's horrible <laughs> yeah. in a certain respect i think they are because they are self sort of 
referential and self-aware. So in that sense, they're, they are elevated because of that. Mm-hmm. They're elevated more than a movie that's not self-aware. <laughs> um, I'd say they're elevated slasher movies. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. All yeah. right. <laughs> Another question. Did, would you consider a twist that the killers for the first time in a screen movie, they were literally just fans of horror movies and not related in any way? Oh, is this the first time that's been that is? It's yeah, yeah, for the most part. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I think that's fine. It's appropriate to today. She uh he the boyfriend was as close no, that's not true. Cause never mind. I was gonna say that was as close to closely related to the main character as Billy, but not really no. because yeah, right. I was just kind of yeah. surprised by that. I don't know yeah. if you'd call it a twist. I guess that's why I asked, <laughs> but just it was a surprise that it was just not directly, directly tied. Which maybe was striking the good balance of like we can have everyone have these connections, but just to have it be a like Sydney, I'm actually your you know extended cousin to the, you know whatever. Like, <laughs> well, maybe we'll find out in the next movie. Yeah. Well, the I, case, I, there's right? one point when I suspected that the killer could be sam's estranged well not real father but father who who left when he found out that she was not his Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that to me would have been fine Mm -hmm. i would have been like damn (laughs) although i think you can't do that if you don't introduce the character right you can't you can't talk about a character and then have them turn out to be the the killer without ever having met them in the movie. Right. So once once we got like an act in and we had not met him in any way, I was like, well, that that's out the door. Would have been even worse than Scream 3. <laughs> exactly. I mean, it would have been really, I would have yeah. been mad. I would have been like, yo, what the fuck? Yeah. He, uh, can't, he can't lay out all these suspects and let it be none of them. Right. right. Well, right. you know that it was technically, but... A, a non-visual <laughs> suspect. So, right. yeah. um, uh, I mentioned Dewey being like the one I was most scared of dying, and who, if they do are doing a scream eight someday, who I'd hope to, to still be in all of them in a way. Mm-hmm. But uh, where, what page were you guys on for that? Like, who were you most afraid of dying? Who, if you could have written it differently, like in a way to shock yourself or just fan service yourself? You know, all those ways. How would you have approached that? You know, I was so sure that one of them would die in Scream 4 that I was kind of at the point. I was like, well, maybe they'll never kill these characters. Mm -hmm. So I was legit surprised when Dewey actually did end up getting killed. Uh, And I would have been. I did have a mild suspicion maybe they'd kill Sydney. It seemed like the most um, it would be the most shocking thing. And I I do remember a few months ago uh, when you know, rumblings like internet rumblings of this new movie were starting to come out. There was this headline that fans will not be ready for what happens in the next scream movie. So the my hell first, does that mean? <laughs> that, my yeah. first thought was, are they going to kill Sydney? <laughs> but, um, but yeah, it's, it did seem like the right choice. It seemed like, um, kind of a Luke Skywalker type of situation calling the old hero back to arms and he sacrifices himself. Yeah. will get of everyone else. So yeah. 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 <laughs> what? I don't know. I thought it was fine. Yeah. I Yeah, so you mean uh, you would have done the same thing? If I'm going to kill one of the three of them? Ye- yes. Probably. I mean, I would probably want to kill Gail yeah. as a character. <laughs> but... Do I think that would have served the movie? No. Because then I think it would become too much of a Dewey revenge movie. Like, Dewey needs to get revenge. Um, It doesn't work that way. But it did work fine that that Gale is the survivor of, of the two of them. Yeah, totally. So, yeah. Well, speaking of Dewey, I thought something uh, a, a way that this one mixed it up a bit that was really interesting was for the screen movies you're always wondering how they're going to present the rules and sort of <laughs> what are the rules in reference to 
So like first one was just about like slasher movies, horror movies in general. Second one, Randy's laying out the rules of what happens in sequels. Bigger body count. Anyone can happen. Even use it. Or no, then it's the third one where his video comes back. For the third one in a franchise, anything could happen. That means even you can dice it. So it's the the movie nerd laying it out, right? This one I was like wondering how now what were they gonna were they gonna lay out the rules of a requill, which they, they kind of started what our kinda rules yeah. gonna be yeah. here. But what it was, it was Dewey laying out the rules of a long established franchise. And I thought like what the rules were uh in that sense were just smart and fun. And I thought that was interesting how he has become an expert at this point. But it was also just a different, interesting approach to make it like more in reference to all these actual killings for them that have happened versus just like movie rules, horror movie rules. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> um, I can't believe I forgot to mention this earlier, but the fact that Heather Matarazzo came back as uh, Randy's sister, I <laughs> thought right. was pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> and the fact, yeah. And the fact that they have like a screening room devoted to Randy that was or dedicated to Randy. We still and that's had... where it happens too, where they lay out the rules. Yeah. Yeah. Even if he's not around to lay out the rules anymore, we still have his <laughs> altar and <laughs> yes. his honor. Yeah. Um, did you guys have any things of note, things you wanted to? Um, I I did stay away from looking at the cast list for this because I had a feeling there would be spoilers in that. Um, but uh, I do, similar to when the time when people were saying, you will not, fans will not be ready for what happens in uh, <laughs> the new Scream movie. Skeet Ulrich and Matthew Lillard started doing a lot of interviews about the 25th anniversary of Scream. So I was kind of thinking, are they going to come back to yeah. life in the new Scream movie? Is that what's going to happen? And I was. Um, so, yeah, when Skeet Ulrich showed up as a uh, hallucination of Billy, I thought that was OK. So that's how it's going to go. And then I expected Matthew Lillard to do the same. And then it didn't happen. So I thought that was <laughs> kind be of such like, a trip. Both yeah. of them. <laughs> right. Maybe he's going to do the next one. Who knows? Yeah. Like, I know now uh, that we've I, established that. Is it fair game where everyone just comes back as a ghost or a right. de-aged ghost? All of the deaths <laughs> of the Scream movies are going to show up. Yeah. And they're going to wave goodbye to everyone at the end while the Ewoks start dancing around. <laughs> uh, yeah. No, I was um, going to say more like the ending of the last, last Star Wars was what was it called where it's like all the forced the voices of the forced ghosts like help them defeat <laughs> right i don't even remember oh yeah okay Jeez, I was, the, <laughs> that movie is kind of weirdly out of my memory because the pandemic happened right after it so mm-hmm. uh yeah um okay what oh mikey madison i mentioned her uh the fact that there, I uh, what do you do you agree with me that that was an intentional once upon a time in Hollywood reference because I'd be shocked if that was just a coincidence I wonder if they didn't so much I, I wonder if it like gave them kind of more like they probably acknowledged it but I wonder if it's like why do I just picture her burning and that would be you know I don't think it's like oh we should do an homage to it I don't think they necessarily went like that <laughs> I well in, in any case it it played that way to me and that it made me so happy it was great um are you are either of you interested in hearing about my D box experience watching this movie? Sure. <laughs> Where I don't even know what that is. Well, so I guess the, yeah, they it's have to. motion seats that go along oh, with, no. with the movie. Does. They have them over okay. at the the Chinese theater. <laughs> yeah. Okay. It was like I mean, if the killer was banging on the door, your seat would like no you know, way <laughs> that way. <laughs> that the beginning when the locks would turn back and forth, your seat kind of turns to the left and right <laughs> along with <them>. uh, <laughs> When she was like, uh, this, but you said no me- memorable set pieces. That When she was in the wheelchair in the hospital, that I loved that. I I thought that was an awesome set That piece, was pretty that cool, was, yeah. That I like all of else. that scene. Your yeah. seat would was kind of like rocking like you were in the wheelchair <laughs> with her. It was all very well synchronized, too. And yet, like when someone got stabbed it would like you know jolt there must just be like one (laughs) person out there who's like the d-box person who's there (laughs) just like program all those movies i mean i didn't expect it to be as accurate and well uh well set up as it was the lock twisting i when that happened right at the beginning like, oh i am in this is gonna be a lot of fun and uh you know if there was like a like a crane shot that like uh from 
up above that like comes down the seat kind of moved in that way too so oh it was i it's not something i would do more than once i probably wouldn't uh, it's not something i would do for a first time watching a movie but uh since it was my second time i was like why not spring for that and see what it's all about because it's been around for like 12 years and i had never done it so wow we uh yeah. so you're wow. welcome everyone. You know, <laughs> now you know now i know yeah now we know now the world knows that sounds great so you I, some D-box. I don't know anyone else who's ever done it so. um we didn't mention the the filmmakers up front sorry folks we try to do that but the directors are matt Bettinelli Olpine, Olpine and Tyler Gallette. And um, I thought it was cool. They did. Uh, they were huge fans of Wes Craven and the Scream films. And I think that definitely uh, says something about how uh, the torch was so well passed between them. But it was cool. They did their research as far as talking to everyone that they could who knew Wes Craven and was involved, you know, with the originals and all that. And uh, some things they learned, you know, some some rules that Wes, you know, was stood by and uncovered or whatever that they are unspoken or not. The one that I wanted to share I liked was the idea to make audiences feel like they're in the hands of a madman. <laughs> that was a good okay. one. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> this was a quote um, from Bet- Bettinelli Olpine with bloody disgusting says when we were in pre-production was we talked to Patrick Lussier who edited the first four and it was the beginning of our year long meet everybody we possibly can who knew Wes and get every piece of information that we could. The thing he told us is when they started editing the Drew Barrymore scene, he said that Wes came in and said, I need the audience to feel like they're in the hands of a madman just from the jump. And that became a guiding North star for us throughout the process. Mission accomplished. I think. Yeah. And that's like, you know, in the, the editing, how long do you hang on a gruesome shot for? Or just, yeah, I mean, every level, yeah, can pop up. So it's a good North Star to have, I think. I uh, did want to mention, I wish I could say I figured this out myself, but it was a, an article that I read. Sydney mentions a husband that she has. The husband's name is Mark. Does that ring a bell for either of you? No. Mark Kincaid was the name of Patrick Dempsey's character no, in Scream they got 3. together. So no. there is, people are speculating that that's who she's married to. And maybe we'll, maybe we'll find out in the next movie. I was just oh going to say, God. I thought it was interesting and kind of good that we didn't see her husband, you know? Yeah. I mean, yeah, it could, could be another person named Mark, but isn't like one of the first rules of screenwriting. It can't have two people with the same first name. Like, Well, maybe it's Mark with a C. Mm-hmm. Oh man, that's yeah. true, right? Yeah. <laughs> All right, yeah. you have anything to note for us, Tim? No. <laughs> okay. <then. laughs> this guy, this movie. What, what could I possibly have after all of that? Kevin Williamson didn't write it. That's my thing. To note. No, <laughs> he's no. executive producer. There's a. I suggest it. There's a great um, interview that uh, the podcast Horror Queers did with Kevin <laughs> Williamson. Just 20 minutes. There's some. Uh, you get to hear some fun. Uh, what his his outlines were for Scream 5 and 6, as well as an alternate intro to Scream 4 that he originally had planned. Um, Last little thing that I had I thought was so funny, there was a final trailer released for this film that was like closer to um, a minute long that like has some of the advanced quotes or whatever. Mm -hmm. But they used footage from Stab 8 in this movie where it is the metal ghost face uh, (laughs) with the (laughs) flamethrower as if it was a part of this That's screen funny. movie it is cracked me up seeing that. <laughs> cool. I bet people loved that. Yeah. <laughs> um, it was weird seeing a scream movie begin without the dimension logo. Yeah. For me, yeah. it was kind of a, yeah, it's a paramount movie. I don't know what happened there, but um, well, uh, and uh, okay. I know you guys said that it, you felt that it didn't have the touch of Wes Craven and, I, I definitely see that. But I got to say, if you were to show me all five movies in a row and ask me, which movie do you think had a different director? Which movie was not Wes Craven? I'm pretty sure I would choose Scream 4. That movie feels hmm. so wildly different from any of the others. It this was, feels like a minor departure. I thought it was... Four feels like a wild departure to me. Fine. I don't know. I thought it was really interesting how you said four, what you didn't like about it so much was the humor for... Usually the general complaint about three that I'd agree with was that it's not so much, it's just some, now I just kind of like it about it, but that three is the one that sort of stands out as the more like 
humorous, you know, uh, comedic one versus Scream 4. Yeah, I, I, yeah, it's got Parker Posey, it's got Patrick Warburton in there. Yeah, there, I, you're right. There is a lot of weird. I just think it's funny you went there. Yeah, but, that too. Yeah. But I don't. Scream Four. I, it felt a little. It almost felt scary movie ish with how, how self referential hmm. it got. And so, like, yeah, it, it it felt very like not just a, separated from reality in a way that Scream Three didn't quite. Yeah, a lot of people are joking in Scream Three, but it still felt. I still felt the weight of the kills in that, which I didn't really feel that in Scream Four. So, which I don't think was the intention with Scream Four. They were tr- they were doing they did what they were trying to do. I think so. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, if that, I think what we, you said, what we have to say about <laughs> Scream Twenty Twenty Two. So, wind down a bit here. Some recommendations. And get on out, Peter. You want to start us off? Um, I am going to recommend Dead. Uh, show that uh, actually I'm not sure where you get it now it's an FX show but it's called Better Things um, Mikey Madison from this movie plays Pamela Adlon's daughter it's Pamela Adlon is the star but she plays her daughter and it's a show that I binged during the pandemic and it is uh, <laughs> so it's been a while but, <laughs> but um, it's it's a wonderful show she does a fantastic job they all do and uh, yeah if you haven't seen it it's well worth your time so yeah, it's funny and it's poignant and it's dramatic. It's really great. Cool. Tim, I watched. I've watched a few horror films um, over this Christmas break or holiday season. Um, I think the one I liked the most was Censor. Hmm. Do you know about this movie? I know of it. I have not seen it. It's pretty solid. It's really visually cool like it's shot the well whatever just watch it It, it's (laughs) colored amazingly like the the and and i don't just mean the the post coloring i mean like the set design color palettes that are like like on set are amazingly well constructed and super interesting um and that's like one small aspect of what makes the movie good it's really really cool so yeah i would i would go see that i don't want to say anything about it it's like i went in blind and i was very happy i did cool Mm -hmm. i'm mostly blind too so i'll I'll check it out man the color design whoo it's so cool (laughs) i think that that's like modern filmmaking in turn in in horror in particular you can do a lot like you can get away with a lot and like watching how, I guess, I don't know who really makes this call ultimately if, if it is the set designers or if the director is ultimately the one who's like making this decision and then having everybody follow some rules. But either way, like just the the palette and like the the dimension that a shifting palette can give to a story. Mm-hmm subconsciously is something I've just been paying more and more attention to. Mm. And like, I think that stuff is amazing. Right. If you're going to shoot in color, use it. Yeah. Like (laughs) seriously. Um, Great. Well, just real quick, uh, looking at stuff I've watched recently. I I mentioned this to you, Peter. I watched the Steve Martin movie, LA story for the first time. Yeah. You seen that Tim, maybe not for a while. (laughs) It was just a great, uh, if you like Steve Martin, you'd like it. It's just uh, nice to have, a older Steve Martin movie I hadn't seen. Uh, I guess they all are of his at this point. Pretty much. But yeah. um, have one be good. Have one be fun. I can see it has a little like fandom around it. A solid LA story. And I, I'm always uh, looking for LA set movies and shows now because I live here, not despite I live here. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Check it out. LA story. Great. I was shown that movie when I was five years old. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Something about Steve Martin. My parents would show me every Steve Martin movie they could. I saw them all. And so, yeah, that was one of them. Like Funny. right when it came out on video. So, yeah. Great. <laughs> Steve Martin, uh, horror movie and a TV show with, uh, oh, yeah. with, uh, with Mikey. <laughs> Mikey Madison. Yes. I, I hope Mikey Madison, Jenna Ortega and um, the Girl, I don't think I talk much about her. The one who explains all the rules. That Jasmine something. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
those three I thought really killed it. I think they did a fantastic job. I hope they have a huge career. So yeah, that's great. What I'm saying, right? Uh, well, Peter, it's been great having you here and thanks for having me. This absolutely. Is fun. We hope to hear you. We hope you and Ray get back to it. With Retro of you soon. We can hear you back on there. If not folks, uh, you want to hear some more Peter musings on movies. You can find it retro reviews. Mm-hmm. And, uh, Tim, it's great to be back here with always. I'm looking forward to this year ahead of us. See what the hat pulls, see what the world pulls, see some new releases. Should be fun. Absolutely. All right. Well, and everyone are big ask you, uh, you uh, like being here, we presume you made it this far. Let a friend know. Let's spread the word. And, uh, <laughs> we'll have you we'll have you next time. All right. Well, in closing, R.I.P. Dewey Riley. <laughs> Thanks for listening. And we will see you next time. Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs>